you for being here. To those of you who are in person and to those watching us live streaming, I will ask our board secretary to take roll to establish a quorum for the record. Thank you. President Craighead. Here. Member Benitez. Here. Member Lopez. Present. Member Otto. Here. And student member Aguilar. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, and now we will have our uh, CAMS representative, um, <clears throat> Kyla Diaz, to lead us in the pledge. All right. <clears throat> Please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the <coughs> agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms here by where our board secretary is. Um, and if you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda. The board took action on the following items. Item 3.1, confidential student matters, pursuant to California Education Code 35146, the board voted 4-0, with board member Miller absent, to expel student ID number 6297 in compliance with Education Code section 48900M. The student will be placed in another school district. The student will be eligible to apply for readmission after January 24th, 2025. In item 3.2, public employee discipline dismiss release, the board voted to dismiss two employees. In one dismissal, the vote was 4-0 with member Miller absent, and in the other dismissal, the vote was 3-0 with member Miller absent and member Lopez abstaining. Uh, now we are at adoption of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? And if not, then we need a motion. Move to approve. Second. Uh, any discussion? Um, I'll have our board secretary take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. That passes 4-0. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our student representative from CAMS today. We have Kyla Diaz, and we are happy to hear about you and CAMS and whatever else you have for us. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, if you have not met me, my name is Kyla Diaz, representing CAMS as ASB president. My senior year has been going great, and it is sad to say we only have less than three months going on. I have already been admitted to amazing schools and plan to go into chemical engineering. Many of my classmates have been offered admission to, to schools like Yale, Columbia, Caltech, UPenn, and MIT. I have always known my classmates would be successful in their journey, and I applaud them. With the support of my college and career center, they have helped us they have helped us through FAFSA colleges and scholarship process after applying. They also offer many internship opportunities to all grade levels in support of furthering the interests of our students. On some Fridays, workshops are provided in our English classrooms to learn the information presented by our college and career counselors. As well as Wellness Center also provides excellent communication with weekly events like creating sensory glitter jars or even watching a movie during lunch. Our ASB class has been working hard to provide events that create engagement for our school. We recently had our winter formal with other Long Beach schools in San Pedro and the majority of the students had an amazing time. This semester, we also hosted two Japanese schools with performances from the orchestra and our Korean dance club. Many of our students came to introduce these other Japanese students in shattering our classes. This year, ASB created events to honor a community of people every month, 
previously Black History Month and this month, Women's History Month. Last year, we finished our spring games with many of our student athletes representing their grade level. This year, we will have our multicultural fair um, on Friday to celebrate diversity at camps with many perform for performances like singing and dancing. Our grade levels also are preparing for our exciting spirit rally that involves waking up early and placing posters all around camps. Also to create more spirit, we are planning to do a school-wide lip dub that involves all the clubs, interest groups, and sports at camps in two months. In addition to bringing change for camps, we also opened a student store for our students to purchase any snacks or drinks during lunch. Our ASB continues to work hard in several committees to support the student population. As the clubs at camps continue to grow different passions and interests, I have the honor to see the impact on many students. Many performances from our dance team at their annual dance show and the collaborative high school event Spectrum at Jordan High School. Our other clubs continue to have weekly fundraisers with delicious food and drinks and exciting meetings that invite everyone. At CAMS, competition-based clubs like FRC, VEX, Science Olympiad, and Debate continue to excel against other school teams and reaching many achievements. For example, our FRC team will be going Houston for our second year in a row. Our grade level boards continue to support their grades with special events like Class of 2026 Movie Night next week. CAMS Athletics continues to thrive into the spring season with our track and field, swim, boys volleyball, and boys tennis. We finished the winter season with all of our soccer and basketball teams reaching playoffs for the first time in a while. Since our home games are not scheduled at camps, we have provided numerous spirit buses to support our athletic teams. Many of our students supported these athletes, including our mascot, Rebel the Coyote. Much improvement in the spirit of camps. Classes continue to push students to learn and apply. With some ex AP exams coming up, our teachers prepare the students timely to ace these tests. ASB continues to support the students with positive notes of encouragement. Interdisciplinary projects have already begun for our students at our, for our end of the year projects. These allow our students to incorporate skills learned in their classes and apply them to solve given problems. In correlation to interdisciplinary projects, we have our proof of concept presentation for the engineering design and development class to many experienced engineers and alumni tonight. CAMPS continues to bring one pathway, multiple focuses like biotechnology, computer science, and engineering. We would love to invite you to our open house in June to see these inter interdisciplinary projects. As a senior, I have pride in my school and would love to see this school continue to improve and grow. But all in all, CAMPS is doing amazing. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Kyla. You mentioned that some of your um, peers have been accepted to different schools. Did you mention what school you've been, or schools <laughs> you've been accepted to? Um, I am choosing between, right now, Berkeley and LA. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> um, very impressive. And you mentioned chemical engineering? Yes, correct. Fabulous. Yeah. I'm excited to see what I have in store today. Yeah, well, we wish you all the best. Um, would you like to acknowledge somebody who's here to support you? Um, no, um, as of right now, I do not have anyone here. Okay. <laughs> you yes. have us. You have all of us here yeah. supporting I do. you. I do yeah. have you guys. Yeah. I know, because to, tonight I'm actually going to the um, engineering presentation tonight as well. So I'm already busy. I have, had, <laughs> I have plans. Well, we won't keep you too much longer, although no we do... Um, we do want you to come up here so oh, that yeah. we can get a picture with you. All right, thank you so, so much. So we'll just take a, a quick break.
thank you, Kyla, and we wish you all the best. Um, and we understand you're busy. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next. Yeah. Um, next, I'll direct your attention to the screen where we will see our vision in action. The purpose of having student internships in the district is to provide students opportunities to explore careers and any technical skills needed, learn and utilize workplace skills like communication, problem solving, and time management, and gain work experience, all outside of an academic setting. A couple of projects I've worked on, there was this um, sponsor banner for a middle school and I got to design the banner itself and they liked it and they're gonna print it out and put it up at the school. So what we do as interns, we get to come up with content, we also get to edit and we also get to produce what we come up with. I think it's really cool when something gets posted or a podcast gets posted and you get to say, oh, that's me. You had the idea and it's actually out there now. I feel accomplished and grateful for this opportunity that I have. I love that I get to share people's stories out there and that brings me a lot of peace and joy. These internships provide students a glimpse into the various careers available across multiple departments. Oh, thank you everyone for making those kind of things possible. Uh, let's see, next we have um, public testimony. I don't believe we have any for items on the agenda. So um, we have several for items not listed on today's agenda. So um, we will not be discussing those items um, because of the, uh, because that would be a Brown Act violation. But I'll just remind everybody they have three minutes. We have quite a long list. We have 30 minutes total for public testimony. So we'll get right into it and we'll start with Hillary Postman. And again, it's only three minutes each. <laughs> Hillary. Um, good evening. My name is Hillary and I am a stakeholder in public education. I recently retired from Capistrano Unified after 20 plus years and I was a union officer in our local California School Employees Association local chapter. Uh, please note I do not speak for CSEA. I'm here as a Jewish person uh, in support of fair and equal public education, the freedom to discuss local and especially now catastrophic world events, and in support of Californians for justice. Demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza is a cry for all humanity. Some Jews oppose this and call it anti-Semitic, but there is not a single person in this room or in opposition to CFJ who speaks for all the Jewish people. This is what we call chutzpah, Nicely put, it's, it's anyone who thinks that, uh, it, it, nicely put to anyone who thinks that they can speak for all of us, you've got some nerve. Okay, Judaism is a religion and Zionism is a political ideology. Not every Jew subscribes to. So don't let some Jewish opinions stand as the de facto truth. Um, we have a saying, you put two Jews in a room and you have three opinions. So don't buckle under the pressure of the new McCarthyism, where anyone who disagrees with Israel's policies gets branded as an anti-Semite. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Julius. 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 Greeting fellow board members. My name is Julius Bentley. I am a senior at Cabrillo High School. I am also a CFJ intern. I joined CFJ two years in my junior year, but prior to that, I, in 10th grade, there was an incident. 
I experienced racism, homophobia, fat phobia, and colorism. One of the incidents involved a teacher. I was one of three black students in the Spanish classroom. She singled us out, picked on us, made us feel alone, made us feel trapped, made us feel isolated from our, from my own peers. One incident involved one a, a, young, a young lady. This young lady, her, her and the teacher went back and forth. In, involving in the incident of the student walking out the classroom, the teacher proceeds to say, uh, these N words. Mind you, she is not a black woman. So how did I feel? I felt alone. I felt, how could a teacher even say this? How could she even think, uh, uh of us? I, that happened in second, first semester. While well, second semester, I was alone again, trapped, didn't know what to do, didn't have an outlet on my campus to talk to, to anyone really. So I joined CFJ. CFJ honored my voice, my emotions, and my story, and made me feel like a valued member of my own community, heard me and valued my emotions, listened to what I had to say. And I believe every LBOC student should honor this, should have their stories heard, should be listened to, should have their emotions valued. So I ask you board members, that is what CFJ is about. We are honoring stories of students of today, tomorrow, and the future. So I ask you to, to stand in solidarity with CFJ to honor student story, black liberation, and black reparations. Thank you for your time. You have found your voice, Julius. Uh, Carolina, or Carolina. Good evening, members of the board, student council members, and everyone. My name is Carolina Guajardo, and I'm a parent at Bixby Elementary. Our Bixby community is here today to discuss playground structures, improvements taking place this school year that do not meet the needs of all of our students. Bixby is receiving new playground structures for TK through second grades, and this is great, but there's nothing new coming for upper grades. We know this type of updates do not happen frequently, and these new structures will remain for decades. So it's critical that we get this right. Currently, the upper grade playground is an asphalt play, asphalt play space with no accessible grass, shaded area, or play structures. Over the past few years, parents started advocating for attention to this need. Prior and current principals were inquired about the playground. On January 2023, uh, Zoe, a second grade Bixby student, spoke at the school board on this topic, advocating for support through Measure K. Throughout the year, we were told it would be taken care of, and even after frequent requests for specific information, we were told to wait until the summer of 2024. Early 2024, we inquired Principal Vieira on how to provide input and support on this with limited success just to learn a week after by Felicia Krops from facilities that Principal Vera had approved all plans without input from students or parents. We all know kids live for recess. Furthermore, research has shown the impor importance of playground structures as a key component of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, and how the input and involvement of students in the planning might have a bigger impact on their use. We, can, uh, we want to give all grades a safe, fun place to play, recharge and reconnect. Our kids deserve better. We're requesting funds for an upper level playground structure to be added to this playground update coming up in March 2024. We're thrilled that our schools are receiving so many updates and improvement, improvements thanks to bonds our community has approved. However, the current third through fifth grade playground structures are and improvement plans at Bixby are insufficient, inequitable, and need your attention immediately. Our questions for you are, why was this not addressed in the upcoming playground construction? And what is this process to make a formal request to the district? Thank you for your attention. I do have a few printouts of uh, neighboring schools that I'm gonna pass around for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next we have Emilio. I don't want to do it. I don't think I want to do it, but still. 
Dear school board men, members, my name is Emilio Cornejo and I am a third grade student at Bigsby Elementary. I am here today because I have noticed something important that I would like to share with you. One of my favorite parts of school is recess. When it's time when my friends and I can play, run around, and have fun together. However, I have noticed that our playground lacks enough structures for us to play on. We we have we only have two monkey bars and a chin up bar, but I believe we need more to make our recess even better. Having more playground structure would encourage physical activity and help us develop important skills like balance, coordination, and teamwork. It would also give us more options to play. I understand that adding a new playground that adding new playground structures may require time and resources, but I believe that this is an investment worth making for the well-being and happiness of all school students at BKB. I believe, no, I and I kindly urge you to consider my request and prioritize the addition for more playground structures at this time. Thank you for your time and I am ho- and I am hopeful that together we can make our school playground even better an even better place for all students to play and have fun. Thank you Emilio. Next we have Anjali Anjali? Hi, and once again, it's pronounced Anjali. Um, good evening, faculty members, board members, and everybody, everybody else here with me today. My name is Anjali Aldana, and I am currently a senior at Cabrillo High School, and I'm also proudly an intern with Californians for Justice, and I also happen to be CFJ's club president. As somebody who has thrived in school, being a part of leadership is all I've ever known. And through various leadership opportunities, I have never felt so safe in a place where I can feel like I can share my voice, my opinions, and my hopes and my dreams and have them be listened to. I am currently a part of CFJ, ASB, and again, various other different clubs. And through CFJ, I feel like they have made an impact in student voice like no other community I have been a part of. CFJ has opened the door for me personally, a child who has not only had such a great disadvantage here in school settings, but in life as general. Somebody who has beaten the odds multiple times and who someone who continues to beat them. CFJ has opened doors to myself and has taken off the lens that student education is not only what they only teach us in classrooms, but it's everything else. CFJ has been the voice and advocate for underserved communities like myself and black and brown youth. So I'm here today to say that CFJ is not a threat. CFJ stands for student voice, black liberation, black reparations. Not only that, but it's my home. It's my community. It's where I can go and feel safe. And I know that I won't be judged. So I asked the board to continue their partnership with CFJ and not to let false accusations or rumors deteriorate from that. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, Next, we have Sarai. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Sarai Parks. I, oh, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Sarai Parks. Um, I am a senior at Lakewood High School, and I'm also proudly an intern at CFJ, and I am also chapter president at Lakewood High School. First, I wanna start off by saying thank you. Thank you for inviting such an amazing organization into my school that helped me and many other black and brown students have right like this to speak our voice. Recently this year, I have been part of two district events. In both of those events, you guys asked me my vision for 2035. What is my vision for black and brown students to be more future ready? And I told you guys to have more BIPOC organizations just like mine. So I'm gonna give you guys kind of some explanations on why I feel like we should have that. I told you guys that black and brown students need more representation. Standing up here right now, being on YouTube, speaking to you guys is giving students like me that representation. And also we need more exposure. 
just two days ago, I was in Sacramento talking to legislators. I don't know any other opportunity like that that would give people like me the opportunity to speak at such a big light. And I feel like without CFJ, I wouldn't be here today in general. CFJ gave me the voice that I feel like I never really had. Um, even before I started CFJ, my sophomore year, I did a walkout, and the walkout was very powerful, but now that I do have CFJ, I feel like I could do something 10 times more powerful. I feel like CFJ is the backbone to everything that I need. CFJ is the backbone to everything that every black and brown student need. So I'm asking you guys today to continue the partnership with CFJ and to bring in more BIPOC organizations, not or just like CFJ. So other students like me could talk about different organizations and definitely talk about this one. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Shia. 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 Hello, um, my name is Shia Darden. I'm a student, a senior at Lakewood High School. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a, a product of Long Beach Unified School District Elementary School. I went to Webster Elementary School for from K kindergarten to fifth grade. And during my experience there, it was not very positive. I endured many things because of my skin color and because of my race. I was excluded out of um, extracurricular programs. I was excluded on play playgrounds. I was excluded in classrooms. I was isolated. Um, it was many things that I went through at that school um, put onto me by staff and students that I did not appreciate. So for my middle school's year, for my middle school years, I was I decided to leave the district and go to LA Unified School District. So I came back to um, Long Beach Unified School District for um, during the pandemic because it was easier and I had more hope for the district today. Um, at my time at Lakewood High School, I have endured some of the same things, um, not the same teachers, but it, not the same exact experiences, but the experience doesn't matter. It matters how I felt and what was put on to me. Um, I may forget what was said, but I will never forget how it made me feel. So with that being said, um, during my senior year, I was introduced um, to CFJ by my friend Sarai. Now, I am someone who talks a lot. Um, I've always talked about things that I've deemed important. I've always talked about things that other people deemed important. I talk about things that just make my day. So CFJ did not give me my voice, but it amplified my voice. It gave me the, the space to speak, to be heard, to heal from the traumas that I've endured and being in Long Beach Unified School District. I believe that this organization is important because without it, I wouldn't have anything positive to say about the district. Um, so please continue your partnership with um, CFJ. And I say this not only because um, it gave me the voice, but I want, I want little girls that look exactly like me to not feel the same way that I felt about the district. So, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Megan. Megan. Hello board, um, I see a lot of familiar faces. My name is Megan Lane. I graduated from Long Beach Poly in the year of 2022. Um, I joined CFJ when I was in the ninth grade. Um, I was lost, like many ninth graders. Um, coming from a troubled past, a troubled neighborhood, I was going down the wrong pass, path inevitably, but CFJ was my home and will forever be my home. Um, I am currently, studying to be a secondary education teacher at the um, Long Beach City College. And I am currently working at Buffum Total Learning Center, which is in Long Beach Unified School District as a behavior technician to children with special needs. Um, during that four years, I was able to become a California student delegate, state delegate, um, co-chair and co-founder of the Long Beach Unified Superintendent's Advisory Committee um, and the NAACP Award and Scholarship winner. I was also recognized by um, the United States Congress and the United States Board of Representatives. I am saddened and appalled that CFJ's status at this district is being threatened. Um, I'm angry because the 
the platform that gave me my voice is being threatened. Um, I was able to accomplish so many things at this district and my school, and knowing that CFJ might not be, future may not be um, long be longevity, um, it makes me very sad. Um, so as a future teacher for the Long Beach Unified School District, I do not want to work at a district who does not center black and brown students. And as an ex-student of Long Beach Unified School District, I would not want to be a student at a district that does not prioritize black and brown students. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have May. May. Good evening, my name is May. I'm a faculty member at Cal State Long Beach and I was a volunteer and research fellow with CFJ from 2014 to 2020. During those years, I had the great privilege of really learning from CFJ's youth, black and brown youth-led transformational work that has been an exemplar and a model for me and who I strive to be as an educator and as a human being. CFJ, as you've already seen, shows how young people are the agents and leaders of healing from the trauma that's caused by systemic violence, while also transforming the conditions that surround us that foster this violence. Um, young people shared with me you know, that it was really CFJ that, quote, healed my heart. It gave them a sense of hope and power that they could change the conditions that were leading to such heartbreak. And, as young, and echoing what young folks have already said, they also told me, I've never felt such love as I've had with CFJ. I feel like I'm in a family, end quote. And as many of you have already seen, what CFJ is really fighting for is to make sure that this feeling that young people have in CFJ is found everywhere, in every single classroom, in every single space, throughout LBSD and in Long Beach. You, as you've already seen, students are blooming into these powerful and outspoken advocates. And I also want to point out that when we center young people's voice and innovation and creativity, we find transformative solutions that maybe sometimes as adults we don't always think about. For example, relationship-centered schools that came from young people's research. And even sometimes adults in CFJ were initially skeptical, but when we really centered young people's voices and solutions, we saw, yes, if we want young people to succeed in school, they need to be emotionally, mentally, holistically supported, and we need to try to transform and updo things like systemic racism that are creating um, these uh, emotional harms. And I also want to point out and commend the LBUSD staff and the partnerships that folks have forged here so bravely in collaboration, collaboration with CFJ. Um, as an educator, I see firsthand how our conditions can pit teachers and students against each other. And it's through these partnerships that CFA has been, CFJ has been telling students, for example, yes, we want teachers to care for us. In order for that to happen, teachers need to be cared for systemically. And so we know that it's through black and brown youth-led organizing that is helping to shape the conditions where all of us can thrive. And so I really urge you to continue this partnership that has been so fruitful and so transformative. I also want to say as a non-black person of color, fighting for black reparations is also about long-term cultural and systemic transformation for all of us. When we are living in a society steeped in anti-blackness, that harms all of us, and we also need to uplift those who are most impacted. Please recommit to this partnership so that we can all thrive and live in a healthy uh, Long Beach. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Francesca. Francesca. Hi, good evening. I am here as a Long Beach resident, a Chicana, an educator, and an advocate for youth in Long Beach. And I am in full support of Californians for Justice, who is doing important work in advocating for racial and educational justice. This work is especially important for students of color who are underrepresented in college prep courses and overrepresented in school discipline cases. Their work addresses this equity gap as they center students so that they can navigate through systems and institutions that were historically built to keep them out. I'm concerned that SF CFJ's work is under question and we have to combat false narratives that inaccurately describe equity work as harmful. These false narratives claim that students' agency is being taken away and implies that students lack the critical thinking skills to speak for themselves. And quite frankly, tonight, they all prove that they are powerful and have a voice of their own. 
But this work is liberating for themselves. It's empowering for students. It validates their experiences and develops meaningful relationships within school communities. Through this, through this, students are exposed to skill sets that allow them to advocate for themselves and break institutional barriers. This approach to school systems has been proven to work, and many schools are moving in a direction of liberatory practices, and this all improves student retention and student success. For this reason, I ask that the board continues to strengthen this relationship with CFJ, and I also just want to thank all the students for their power and sharing your stories and your voices with us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alyssa. Alyssa. Good evening, board members. My name is Alyssa Gutierrez. I have two children in the district, first and fifth grade, both at Henry. I'm also a commissioner on the City of Long Beach's Equity and Human Relations Commission. I am here this evening to express support for the work Californians for Justice students and staff bring to our school district. I'm proud to send my children to school in Long Beach Unified because I know that equity and inclusion are core values and I appreciate the strides that the district has made to center the voices of our most marginalized students and appreciate that the work, uh, that the con district continues to fund the work of CFJ and this amazing program. However, despite progress made, I'm deeply concerned about the recent attacks on CFJ students. As if our young people, particularly our black and brown youth, are incapable of thinking for themselves. We know they have agency, as a speaker before I said this, as we've heard from all the students tonight. And they're not blind to the world around them. It's not lost on any of us that these attacks came as a direct result of CFJ's support for the people of Palestine. As a Jewish woman, I find it extremely dangerous to continue to conflate the criticisms of Israel and, and uh, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. It is not anti-Semitic to support the freedom of Palestinians. It is not anti-Semitic to call for food, water, and aid to the millions of children who are literally starving to death right now in Gaza with the full support of our United States government. And it is not anti-Semitic to call out the genocide that is unfolding before our eyes. How patronizing to think that our young people can't see the atrocities for themselves and determine that no human being on this earth should ever be treated that way. And how disconnected are some to think that our young people, particularly black and brown youth, don't see themselves in the struggle of Palestinian people. And how invisible do you think that the Palestinian Arab and Muslim students in this district feel when their pain is not acknowledged, or worse, it's labeled anti-Semitic? The recent weaponizing of this term is actually undermining the real anti-Semitism that my people do face, particularly from right-wing conservatives in this country. The same interests that are attacking ethnic studies and equity efforts across this country. So today I ask you to recommit, deepen your um, support for programs like CFJ, reject the false narratives, reject conflating anti-Zionism and criticisms against Israel and what's happening with anti-Semitism. And I urge you to continue to um, center our students' needs and their voices and trust that our students know what they need. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Awitz. Awitz. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Baker, Deputy Superintendent Dr. Brown, community members in the audience, those of you tuning in from home. My name is Awitz Romo Gonzalez, and I'm the lead organizer for Californians for Justice here in Long Beach. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you, speaking to some of you, and if I haven't, uh, hopefully we can make that happen in the near future. I'm here to speak on some important matters, but before getting into it, I want to share a very quick story. This past Monday, two of our interns and I went to the state capitol in Sacramento, one of which is right here next to me. As part of the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color, or ABMOC's Advocacy Day, we decided to make this trip on short notice in solidarity with ABMOC's efforts 
to ensure legislative support for a variety of policies that impact black and brown students across the state, such as AB 2441, which eliminates state mandates that require educators to notify police for a broad range of student behaviors and incidents. During our visits with state legislators, two of our CFJ interns had the opportunity to speak amongst other people who are advocating for policy changes. We were in a multi-generational group with a few formerly incarcerated people who are now organizers, mentors, and even some directors of their organizations. It was a highlight moment for myself and for our interns to experience what true solidarity means, what it looks like and what it feels like. Having never met these people, everyone understood the assignment and we executed in a very powerful fashion. But more importantly, our interns got, to, got the opportunity to share their stories and experiences and ultimately confirmed support from legislative staff who we met with. I share this story because this is just a small glimpse of what we do at CFJ. Yes, we're at schools, we organize students to fight for racial and educational justice, but we're also running leadership development programs that allow the opportunity for young people to develop into lifelong agents of change and justice. This is something we need to continue at our high schools. If the district is committed to providing pathways and resources for black and brown students to thrive and have a healthy schooling experience, our partnership must continue. I wanna remind folks that LBUSD has a long standing history with strategically partnering with community organizations in the city. We are an asset to Long Beach schools, to the community and the future of this district. The Long Beach organizing community has shown up today to support CFJ because they are aware of how important it is for us to continue our efforts in securing transformation in our schools. I ask you today to remain committed to investing in improving the outcomes of black and brown students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more speaker. We have um, Naida. Thank you. Um, I'm Nada Tushnet, and I'm here speaking with two aspects of my life. One is, as a Jewish woman, I believe very strongly that my background says, when we said never again, we meant it for everybody and not to be done by anybody to us, to anyone. The other aspect of my life is that I am a retired educational researcher. And I know we can summarize what makes good schools, what makes students thrive, and we're seeing an example of it here. If you can't see it here, you'll never see it anywhere. Um, we know that schools work best when students feel related to the school and they do well when they feel that relationship. There's a kind of saying among us researchers that schools are good when they develop, when they are, they have rigor, relationships, and relevance. So the rigor is in the curriculum, the relationships and relevance is in organizations like this, as you can see, and actually, there's quite a bit of rigor in it, too, as we heard about going to Sacramento. But this is what schools should be. I wish my son had been in a school that had a program like CFJ. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have time. Do we have time for? Any more? Okay, we have time for one more. Madam Chair, how many more yeah. comments do we have left? Um, let's see, and then one, two, and then five after that. So if my colleagues uh, are uh, good with it, I recommend that we uh, continue and listen to the remaining public comments, Madam Chair. Uh, are you making a motion yes. to that? Yes, to extend public comment so that the remaining public speakers can make, uh, <laughs> make public comment. Okay. Well, we have a motion on the floor, so. I'll second it. Okay, uh, any discussion? All right, I'll have our board secretary take a roll call vote. 
Thank you. President Craighead? Aye. Member um, Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. So that passes for zero. Thank you. Okay, so um, next we have Jennifer. I'm a new parent to a two-year-old daughter, um, and I plan to enroll my daughter in early childhood education here in the district as well. Um, I'm here to speak in part or in support of the district's Lincoln Elementary, Hill Middle School, and up in Cambodia. I've also had the honor to work alongside CFJ through our citywide investing youth campaign, where we've advocated and organized for more structural investment and funding for all youth. Um, and have succeeded in securing a million dollars to support public health, climate resilience, and youth leadership. It's clear CFJ has made significant progress and has served and centered young people in Long Beach, both on and off campus. CFJ is in deep alignment with the LBSD's core values, equity policy, vision 2035, and the board goals and guardrails. And we need to continue partnering and collaborating with one another so that our public school system can be a place where we honor cultural material reparations for black students, where we can have an inclusive and relevant curriculum with plentiful funding and resources owed to generations of black students. Together, our school will amplify stories of black joy, humanity, and knowledge. Please continue to double down your commitment to black and brown students and continue the district's partnership with CFJ. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next we have Omar. Good evening, uh, Board of Education, Superintendent Jill Baker, Deputy Superintendent uh, Tiffany Brown, uh, my people. Um, <laughs> I'm really nervous. I don't know why I'm nervous. Uh, going after all these rock stars is really hard to, to top that. And, and I think a lot of people have already said a lot of what I wanted to say. So, um, you know, again, I'm here really to remind us as a community of the long lasting partnership that CFJ has had with this board, with this district. Um, you know, uh, it, it wasn't always great. There was times where we had tension and we had to work through that. And today is no different. Um, I think I've had conversations with folks in executive leadership. You know, our partnership with, with Dr. Brown um, is one of, of really looking at our humanity and understanding that we have shared vision and shared values and being able to center that and ground that when things get really hard and committing to working through that. Um, and I think that we owe that. As adults, we owe that to the young folks who have made it the priority to come here today to speak, to share their story with you all. Um, we didn't tell them to say that. They, they chose what they wanted to share with you all. Uh, we're just here to hold the ground so that these young folks can, can really tap into that power that we know they all have that, that blessing, right, from birth. Uh, but unfortunately, there are too many adults uh, in our schools who don't believe that, who, like folks have said already, are patronizing and, and are still working through some of those in, internal biases and races, uh, sort of ideas around what black and brown people are capable of. Um, and so we're just here to, to really just speak to the power of our young folks, the power of, of really being in, in deep partnership with each other, centering all the values that this district has committed to, um, and to just say that we are in alignment with y'all. Like we wanna do this work. We don't wanna go anywhere. We wanna continue to figure this out and I think that the, the horizon that we're, that we're all embarking on is gonna be extremely difficult, extremely difficult. Given the budget cuts that are on the horizon, y'all gonna have to make some really difficult choices. And all we want you to do is to not forget the young folks who you all have to committed to serve. I have babies who are in the, you know, who, who have a lot of needs. And, and I worry sometimes when we have to make hard choices that my babies are, are gonna get left out. They're not gonna get served by the adults who I have entrusted to serve them. And so I'm here as a, as a brown man, as a Chicano man, um, ready to find solidarity with my black uh, 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 siblings, my black community to fight for reparations and cultural material reparations, because it is time. We are tired of waiting, we need it now. And I think that in deep partnership, we can get there. So uh, that was not what I planned to say, but that's what I said. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you. 
Next, we have Janice. Good evening, my name is Janice, um, and I've been a Long Beach student my whole entire life since preschool, starting at Star King Elementary School, to Hughes Middle School, to Lakewood High School, and even Cal State Long Beach. So this is, this is my home, this is where I've been. And seven years ago, I joined CFJ as a high school sophomore. And CFJ, Californians for Justice, they gave me a voice, and they made me feel empowered as a low-income, first-generation student of color who just felt completely powerless in my community and in my school. And I believed so much in our mission as a high school student of uplifting black and brown youth voices, so much that with the help of other CFJ youth leaders and organizers, I created and led the first CFJ chapter club at Lakewood High School in, ho <laughs> in hopes of reaching more marginalized black and brown youth that wanted to have a voice in their community. And today, the Lakewood Chapter Club is one of our strongest bases, led by our amazing youth leader, Sarai Parks. And it just warms my heart that seven years later, we, Californians for Justice, are continuing to uplift and empower youth voices at Lakewood High School and other schools in LBUSD. Today, I'm proud to be working for CFJ and supporting our equity design teams in addressing equity dilemmas and disparities in their schools in alignment with LBUSD's Equity and Inclusion Initiative and Vision for 2035. My ask is that you all continue supporting the meaningful work that we do, you know, to create equitable and inclusive schools that LBUSD is envisioning for 2035. I would hate to see something so impactful and so meaningful be derailed in a time when we need it most just because of some false accusations. So please don't forget our, about our black and brown students. They need you the most. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Michael. Hi everybody, I'm Michael Gray from Poly High School. Um, CFJ, Californians for Justice, has a superpower. They help young people believe in themselves. They help young people gain their personal power. They help young people build relationships based on a shared vision for lifting others up. Those are the skills and values our community needs desperately. The infrastructure CFJ has cr that they have created works. My encouragement to the district is to continue their partnership with CFJ. And my encouragement to CFJ is to work at each site so these powerful student leaders daily share their leadership skills and their mental health skills to every student. These peer mentoring efforts will supercharge personal change and systemic change for the good. 30 years ago, my friend and fellow educator Kamal, at that time he was also a lead organizer for the Malcolm X grassroots movement, introduced me to a Jewish brother and teacher, Michael. Michael was writing a newspaper called Turning the Tide as part of a community organizing group, People Against Racist Terror. Uh, Kamal and Michael were instrumental in deepening my understanding about the oppression Palestinian people were experiencing. This is 30 years ago. While organizing marches and organizing community members, uh, Michael and I would sit and reflect on the similarity of some Jewish people being angry with him and feeling threatened by his advocacy. But when the hate and real anti-Semitism towards Jewish people is brought up, it's a humanity issue. There is no room on this earth for hatred towards anyone that follows Ju Judaism. But Michael was labeled anti-Semitic 30 years ago, as are many Jewish folks in 2024 that support Palestinian freedom. The fact that our students identify with oppressed children halfway around the world is a source of power. Young people have always been at the forefront of needed change. For example, South African children yet led the Soweto uprising in 1976. This really kept the movement going towards the consistent tearing down of the apartheid system, like the Palestinian experience perpetrated by white settlers. It reminds me of the great stage musical Serafina that helps Soweto youth tell their story. I especially recall a line, an injury to one is an injury to all. We know Dr. King wrote from the Birmingham jail, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Lastly, the discomfort of those unable or unwilling to process the truth can't be a reason to penalize the truth teller. Thank you for extending the time. That was really cool. Thank you.
Hello, good evening, board uh, and chair. Um, my name is Sergio Donis. I am a resident here in Long Beach. My daughter is an eight-year-old student at Bixby Elementary School. Her name's Quetzal. And uh, just like Carolina and Emilio, who did really well in presenting earlier, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the playground at Bixby. It has been a long time issue for as long as Quetzal has been a student at Bixby. The playground equipment or lack thereof has been a huge issue. It's pretty much all concrete. And so when we heard of Measure Q and the, the $1.7 billion in, in bonds that would come to the schools, we were super excited. Unfortunately, it has come to our attention that there's currently not a plan for a playground for third to fifth graders uh, to use. And we're extremely disappointed, to say the least, with the lack of communication and cooperation. And we'd like to see a plan implemented to include everybody, all the students at Bixby. Um, it is absolutely necessary that they all have access to a safe playground. My own daughter, at one point I got a call to pick her up from school when she hurt herself in the playground. And my thought was she probably hurt herself really bad. She might have hurt her head. I was extremely worried, as I'm sure many parents have gotten those calls from the school nurse and rushed to school to pick up your kid. Um, and you know, luckily, she wasn't seriously injured. But I know I can't be the only parent that has those concerns. Um, and you know, we're asking for more options for the Bixby students um, and that you know, we followed through and that we work together to figure out how to fix this. Um, you know, and if you look at the core values of this board, it includes centering student needs and voice, um, which I think we saw in display, full display here today with the students speaking on other issue. Um, authentic community engagement and collaboration. It's, this is clearly, as Carolina stated, this has been a long time issue that's been communicated time and time again. Um, and we need an, uh, another value that's important, environment that fosters connection, respect, and safety, equity, and social justice, and fostering joy and, com and commitment. And we just ask that the school board hear us and work with us today and work with our school so that we, we can implement a safe playground that really will work for all the students at Bixby. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker will be Adam. Um, good evening, uh, board and superintendents. My name is Adam Hijazi. I'm a proud Palestinian American. Um, recently, here in the city of Long Beach, we've passed a ceasefire proclamation. And uh, one of the highlights of that proclamation was to be against any type of hate, whether it's against our Jewish brothers or sisters, anti-Palestinian, anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, uh, and anti-Semitic. And I think that was a very hallmark of this proclamation citywide, right? This covers all entities, all things here in the city. Uh, as adults, uh, dealing with these types of hate uh, incidents, it can be extremely painful uh, and it can be traumatizing. Um, but we as adults are potentially uh, better equipped to deal with these types of incidents and hateful rhetoric as hard as that may be. How is our youth in the district, whether Palestinian, Muslims, Arabs, Middle Eastern, supposed to feel or react knowing that a teacher is potentially equating them with terrorism or feeling like they're un that they're not valued because of who they are? A core duty of our society is to protect our youth from harm. This type of rhetoric that is being blasted in articles is, contra is contrary to those types of protections. I stand in so, uh, strong support with CFJ with raising the voices of our youth. The teachers making such comments should be against valid anti-Semitic comments, but also against anti-Palestinian, anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, and against anti-our Palestinian brothers, our Christian brothers and sisters as well too. Again, I wanna thank all of the students that are raising their voices here and all of the work that CFJ has does and continues doing here in the community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, next on the agenda, we have uh, reports on superintendent advisory groups. Um, Dr. Benitez, do you have a report for our business budget and policy development? No policies uh, in the queue for our April meeting, but we will have uh, policies for review of our colleagues, uh, Madam Chair, in the May meetings. Thank you. 
Uh, let's see, next we have instruction and student learning supports. Uh, Ms. Lopez. Yes, just a couple of things. Um, we discussed the board policy on physical education and activity. Um, you know what, if you could hold on just a minute, we'll just, um, <coughs> we'll just give a few seconds <coughs> so that the room can empty out quietly because otherwise you won't be heard. So um, I think it's quiet now. Okay, so just a couple of things. Um, the first thing we discussed was the board policy on physical education and activity. Um, the revised uh, physical education and activity policy um, is uh, updated to align to current legislation. It now states that physical education classes shall be conducted in the co-educational inclusive manner uh, prescribed by law and that the district shall provide instruction in physical education um, that provides equal access and equal opportunity for participation for all students. And uh, we also discussed the Nexus Edge, which provides an online digital platform for high school students to access general. Thank you. Second. Uh, discussion? I have a um, question on item 14.7, number 25, the contract for uh, 500000 to provide environmental services on an as-needed basis for projects throughout the district. Um, if you could just tell me what the, like, what is the average daily cost of that service? Um, I don't have an average daily cost for this service, but this is a, would be a master contract with TerraPhase. This is a firm that was approved as part of the bench for environmental firms. Um, this um, estimated cost is based off of past work um, provided to um, TerraPhase as well as some projected work moving forward. Okay, and just one other question on um, item 14.8. On board policy, um, on the parent involvement, um, I guess I just need to explain what the current practice is and what changes will result as of the new policy, with the new policy. Because this includes uh, adding Title I language to the policy. Good evening, uh, Viva Mogi. Um, just here to uh, just iterate that we have been engaging with our Title I um, schools around parent engagement. This is around LCAP and other things. We're just codifying this into um, our board policy. So all the things that have been listed have been going on for the last couple of years. So because I see the Title, like, title I schools, um, and language was included there, right? So if it's the same thing, why? Oh, we've never, it's never been written out in a board policy, so we've just been codifying our practices into the board policy. So it's now building an alignment with our board policy and what our practices are. Okay, uh, I did see some language on, um, that states when the district's Title I Part A all allocation exceeds the amount specified in 20 U.S.C. 6318, the board shall reserve at least 1% of the funding to implement parent, guardian, and family engagement activities and shall uh, distribute at least 90% of those reserve funds to eligible schools uh, with priority given to high-need schools. This is speaking specifically to schools that do receive Title I funds, and this is a this is a current practice that is now being put into into policy. So, so this is there is a, yeah, there already is a set aside for parent involvement in the school site budgets for parent involvement. Okay. Is there any further discussion on the consent calendar? Um, we'll have a roll call vote. Thank you, Member Lopez. Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. 
and student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. That passes 4 0. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have our staff report, board goals three and four, mid year data monitoring. Uh, Dr. Bay monitoring calendar presentations following the adoption of the monitoring calendar in January of 2024 by this board the following the adoption of the goals and guardrails of this board so today is picking up on goals three and four after the report that was made to this board in February on goals one and two and I think Dr. Madrigal is going to, she has a slide that reviews the, the four goals. So just calling out to the community that there are four goals and tonight's focus will be on goals three and four. All right, Dr. Madrigal. Thank you and good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to return and um, continue sharing our data story. I also want to thank our level offices as well as OCIPD for the rich dialogue that we've been having um, regarding our data progress monitoring process. And in the spirit of collaboration, as Dr. Baker mentioned, um, I want to encourage the board members as well as senior team members to um, be part of the conversation, the discussion as we're going through the data points. Because as we start to dig into the data, we want to make sure that we keep in mind that this data doesn't belong to a person, a department, or a group of individuals. It actually belongs to all of us in LBUSD. So be keeping that in mind as we're looking at the different data points. And so in order to look forward, uh, we want to be able to look back to some of our work that we've um, engaged in. So the Board of Education has spent some time in the fall as just a review um, developing goals and then adopting some of those goals and we did spend some time last month in February reviewing board goal one and board goal two and so for the purpose of our time today we will be looking at board goal three and that is uh, algebra proficiency as well as um, board goal four college and career readiness and we will spend time building continuing our building our understanding um, the context the purpose of the data who we're centering, as well as why we use the data that we do and the different times of the year that we're reviewing data. So that is our continuing, uh, continuing our understanding around these data points. And as a refresher, we also want to review some of our definitions for these uh, terms. So we have our board goals, which are those aspirational goals. Uh, they're ambitious and they're the long-term goals, the goals for the 2027-2028 school year. Our interim goals are the near-term um, leading indicators of progress towards those board goals. Uh, they should be predictive of goals and used to track progress towards that ultimate goal. And leading indicators, and you'll hear this term throughout the presentation as mentioned in our previous presentation, the leading indicators are predictive measurements in, in our control that lead to our hope for success. Um, these data points tend to be things that we can measure, they're specific, and they're available readily throughout the year. Um, and they're also correlated to a higher level goal. So now that we've reviewed um, some of our terms, we want to dive into goal three, which is our algebra proficiency goal. So goal three, algebra proficiency, reads, in pursuit of having more than 80% of black African-American students meet the algebra A through G requirement by the end of grade nine, the proficiency gap between black African-American students and all other students will decline from 5% in June 2023 to 0% by June 2028. So the interim goals have been set and will be monitored during the five, year, um, the five years leading up to the, the board goals that will evaluate in June of 2028. But we need some leading indicators to help ensure that we're progress monitoring, we're looking at the growth and progress our students are making. And so we've listed the leading indicators as being A, B, C rate in grade eight and grade nine algebra at the end of the year the iReady math placement, grade five and middle school math grades. So now that we understand the leading indicators, let's explore more what, what 
algebra proficiency, that context behind al algebra proficiency means in LBUSD. So we've had two paths that have led to algebra in our district. Um, first, the standard pathway has been that students enter middle school. They take math six, seven, and eight, and as they enter high school, now they are able to, they're prepared to take algebra in ninth grade. Then we've also had the, we have the accelerated pathway, which is one and a half years of standards that are covered in grade six, and then again, one and a half years of standards that are covered in grade seven, with the goal being that when our students enter eighth grade, they have the opportunity to take algebra in eighth grade. So those are historically, those have been our pathways to algebra proficiency. But we need to look at the historical variations also in middle school placement. So currently our sixth and seventh graders, most of them we would say nearly all have been placed in accelerated course math or courses um, in math, meaning what we're gonna refer to as a wall to wall. So they enter sixth grade and they've received the accelerated um, uh, pathway, as well as, as I mentioned, some of our seventh graders. Our current eighth and ninth graders, their pathway has been that some are placed in accelerated um, courses and um, the placement was determined by some criteria that was met. Now, I'm gonna get into the criteria and the recommendations in, later in the presentation to give you more context of what was that criteria. We should consider, um, we, should, we need to consider some, some data for goal three. The first data that we need to consider is the successful completion historically for algebra in grade eight versus grade nine. And we should also examine the successful completion for that wall-to-wall -wall acceleration for math six and seven courses over time. Because of this context, I also want to give a couple of important data considerations um, that as we are looking at these data points, for example, for accelerated pathway, we will continue to monitor all students to ensure that we're also thinking about those support systems that we need to put in place in the event that students start in the accelerated path and we want to, them to continue, but we wanna make sure like we're identifying what are those support systems that they need early on versus later when they perhaps may not be eligible to take algebra in eighth grade? So just keeping that in mind. So when we look at our target cohort, as you recall in goal one and two, we had a target cohort. In goal one, we had a target cohort of our TK students, our current TK students. For goal two, we, tar we looked at our current fourth graders. Now for goal three, our target cohort of students are our current fifth graders. So this visual gives you that, that look at our fifth graders as they're moving um, in the direction of um, our target goal of 80% of our grade nine students meeting algebra A through G requirements with a 0% proficiency gap between black African-American students and all other students. So, they're current fifth graders, but when we are going to look at that, that ambitious goal, they're going to be our ninth graders. So it's important that we monitor their progress. Looking at our fifth graders, we want to look at the leading indicators for this year. And so we took a look at the percent of students that are on or above grade level for iReady, um, specifically the math, algebra, and algebraic thinking domain. And we're also looking at the percent of students that receive a three or higher on the achievement report. And so I just wanna call out the achievement report. We could think of the achievement report like a, the report card for elementary, but there's a difference between um, the achievement report and grades that are issued in middle or the secondary level. At the elementary level, a numerical value is given. So it's a one, two, three, four, and you'll see more on that in the next couple slides. And in the secondary level, we're, we're talking about the ABC rate. So just, just making sure to give everyone context around what the achievement report um, consists of. And now we're looking at our calendar that has been presented to the board. We looked at the calendar initially in January when we were looking at the pro how we were going to progress monitor. 
And we also um, spent some time in, in February discussing the difference between uh, when the, we administered the iReady assessment last year compared to this year. So the, a couple of takeaways just to remind everyone are around the purpose of iReady. So iReady is a diagnostic assessment and it's to tell us how students are doing and to be able to respond to that data at each of the diagnostic um, windows. We just completed administering middle school and we're wrapping up our elementary diagnostic three. The other important um, detail about the change in the administration of diagnostic three is that instructional weeks. Last year, there was a difference compared to this year, for example, in diagnostic three. Diagnostic three last year was given at the end of the year where 100% of our instruction had occurred. This year, we're about 75% in terms of instructional weeks. So again, keeping in mind, there is a difference, but it's important to note that. And also as a reminder that we look at diagnostic assessments differently than summative assessments. Summative assessments, we would look at like an aspect to look at the overall, how did our students do at the end of the year in terms of mastery. So this is just a good visual and a reminder of the purpose of iReady. So let's dig into our first set of data, which is looking at our current grade five students and specifically looking at the iReady algebra domain. So what we noticed when we analyzed our data is that our black African-American students grew similarly to all other students from diagnostic one to diagnostic two. The gap was 12% at diagnostic two with 26% of our black African-American students on or above grade level as compared to 38% of all other students. Um, so one of the things to consider around, uh, to consider when we're talking about the algebra domain is that often we get the question around like, well, what are students in fifth grade learning? How is this related to algebra? And how is it related to their algebra experience, whether it's in middle school or high school? Well, I just want to call out a couple of the, of the items that are measured in this specific domain when students take it in third and fifth grade. So in this domain, we're looking at the skills related to seeing number patterns, understanding the meaning of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and using symbols to write and solve equations, including those to solve word problems. So that helps us think about algebra. When we think of algebra, we use symbols. So it's kind of like setting the stage and it's a good indicator of, of how students are understanding these concepts. Um, so in looking at this data, again, I want to point out some, uh, th something that as we move through each slide, you might see a trend. So when we look specifically at the dark teal and the lighter teal, um, colors. Those are the those are the what we would say those trends that we're going to start seeing that are going to uh, connect to grades. So I'm just going to set that stage right now to hone in on those colors. Now, not forgetting about the other colors, but right now our teal uh, colors are indicating like the at or above grade level, um, and then the other colors are either. Um, they're close to being grade level or below grade level. So I'm dropping these, these seeds along the way to help you connect some of the data. In our next slide, we're specifically now looking at semester one, so current fifth graders, and how they did at the end of semester one on the achievement report. So we're looking at how overall our um, African-American students did compared to all other students in specifically math on the achievement report. Overall, we, we observed that 17%, we observed a 17% gap between black African-American students and all other students earning a three or higher on grade five math achievement report. So I'm gonna pause here because I, I, I left you a little seed there in the previous slide to see if there's any notice or wonderings about this particular visual. Doctora Madrigal, um, 
what do we account for the difference in the gap between grades versus the iReady scores? So the difference here between a 17% gap in terms of fifth grade math achievement report um, cards or grades and the um, scores that the students uh, received. Um, so I guess asked another way, is there any significance between a 13% gap on iReady versus a 17% gap on grades? That's an excellent question. I think we would have to do a further analysis regarding like the achievement report um, because part of the achievement report, just to call out, is that there is some qualitative data that's associated with the achievement report, which um, isn't necessarily associated, let's say, at the secondary level, and that is the comments that are provided. So there's a numerical value that's given in the different um, content areas um, based on criteria that the, um, for example, that we've set, and for example, like common assessments, and we've determined if you get a certain um, a percent on a common assessment. It's a combination of that, and that issues the, the um, achievement numerical value, right? But then there's another aspect to it, which is the comments. And um, the comments are different because the comments can be subjective, and the comments are not necessarily based um, on quantitative data or like some of the assessments that we provide. It can be based on a, a variety of, of factors. Does that force? Well, when we look at if just by look, I think in the next um, couple slides, you're going to start seeing some of the trends. But what, when we look at the percentage of students, for example, on this slide, we're seeing that um, in terms of our African American students compared to all other students receiving a three, as an example, um, there's a gap there, but it's not as big of a gap as those that, for example, when we look at the four. When we look at the four, we're seeing that um, our black African-American students are receiving, less of them are receiving the four compared to all other groups. And what does that mean, Dr. Madriga? <laughs> that means that we are actually developing their, you know, that's something that we need to monitor because it really is indicating to us that um, they're, they're at a three you can equate to like being at grade level and the four is above grade level. So we would have to look at why. Why are they able to meet that three and what's keeping them from getting the four? So it might be related perhaps to the grading. Yeah. I'll infer that. Yeah, it's a good provocation <laughs> kind of question. As we move along, um, we want to move from our target cohort of grade five students. We think of, of other student outcome data that is available to monitor um, whether students are on track to meet goal three in the 27-28 school year. Additionally, we want to ensure that the data that we're considering answers the following questions. So we want to make sure that we're answering how are current grade six and seven students performing in that wall-to-wall -wall acceleration math, accelerated math. How many current grade eight students are enrolled in algebra versus math eight? And what are their ABC rates? And finally, how many current grade nine students have met or are on track to meet algebra A through G requirements? So as a reminder, um, the monitoring of goal three will focus also on enrollment so in the upcoming slides you're, we're going to dig into the enrollment because that's also important to look at the percentage of students that are enrolled in either the accelerated math course in middle school um, or the um, traditional what we called out the math sixth seventh and eighth um, courses our next visual is intended to give you um, an understanding of our current sixth graders so our current sixth graders have mostly all have been um, placed in the accelerated path. So they start in accelerated, they've started in math six accelerated with the goal of moving on next year to math seven accelerated. And then when they enter eighth grade that they are taking algebra. So our students leaving elementary school, it's important to understand that 
We are saying we want them all in accelerated math, but keeping in mind that to, to what I referenced earlier is that monitoring to ensure there's those support systems that we're placing them there. We want to monitor and see what support systems do we need to build in. And there's some additional data points in terms of how many um, students, for example, our black African-American students are currently in math, um, in our accelerated math in sixth grade compared to all other students. An important note also is that our special education students that require a special day class are not part of this um, total number or percentage. Just quick clarifying question on, on, on the last point you made, Dr. Sure. Madrigal. So our 12% of African American students that are in sixth grade accelerated math, um, is that about our proportion of overall black students in our district? And then um, of the 4,482 students, um, if we exclude the special uh, students' special education courses, um, at a future meeting, can, get, can we get how many, can we get the data on what percentage of our special education students at this grade level are African American students? Absolutely. Thank you. And I have a question um, about having all of our um, sixth and seventh graders in accelerated math, so wall-to-wall -wall, um, sixth and seventh graders, what safety nets do we have in place for those students who don't do well in accelerated math, or, um, or at what point do we, or, or do we remove them from that wall-to-wall -wall math? Most of our middle schools are conducting a second period of math support for our students. So students that are either having um, challenges or difficulties based on as they came in from elementary school to sixth grade have a double block of math uh, in the uh, work that we do with students that also capture some of the elective work that they've done. So their math development courses are there to support the students that are needing uh, support for acceleration in sixth and seventh and also in algebra too. We have it in all three levels. So our students would be in two blocks of math and one block being accelerated and then the other one is support so it's concurrent math correct oh, okay yeah so that second block is an accelerated development class as a support in addition we rolled out the tutor.com um, in january that had uh, huge usage at the middle school level for that program specifically in math tutoring Dr. Lund, and is uh, that tutoring available to all students since they're all in the accelerated program? Yeah, that's available to every middle school student, sixth through eighth grade, regardless of math program. Thank you. And, and just to follow up and stop me, Dr. Madrigal, if, if I'm jumping ahead here. So if most of our students are in sixth grade accelerated math, and that's the goal, right, to at some point have all of our students with the right supports. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal is to maintain those sixth grade accelerated math students into seventh grade accelerated math so that that can get into the eighth grade algebra pathway. Um, what do we consider for those students that don't stay, uh, sort of a follow up from uh, President Krekat, for those students that don't stay in seventh grade accelerated math, what are the indicators that we use or the considerations that we take into account? Um, for them not to continue on to seventh grade accelerated math. The counselors and the administrators as well as the teachers assess what students need based on assessments based and one thing that I know we covered here was I ready but we also look at our common assessments that we use and how they're moving towards because our common assessments are also grounded in SBAC you know and, and making making sure that they're proficient in the standards at that grade level also. And that's where the additional support that Dr. Lund just described Correct. kicks in. Yes. Yeah, so currently the criteria if a student fails Math 6 Accelerated, second semester, they would backslide into a Math 7 class. There is an opportunity for them to get back into algebra um, based on their Math 7 performance. Uh, in, in eighth grade? Correct. Okay. So ev even if you're no longer in seventh grade Accelerated Math, if you do well in... Yeah, grade if math. you pass mass seven, mm -hmm. straight mass seven mm -hmm. with an A, B, or C, and you meet or exceed on S back, you can make it back. You're into back algebra. onto eighth grade algebra. Okay, thank you. And um, one last question on this one: 
so how long have we been doing this with the um, accelerated math wall-to-wall -wall, six seven eight this is the first year with a hundred percent last year we had 20 of 22 schools this year is 22 out of 22 for sixth grade accelerated thank you thank you those are excluding all excluding students that are in special education mm -hmm. Some students. Some. So um, as many of our schools have moved to an all-accelerated program, many of them um, have put their RSP students okay. into accelerated courses okay. as well. And we have a few schools, um, Jefferson comes to mind, that even their MM students are now accessing an accelerated program. Okay. It, it, again, great for our future mm -hmm. when we look back at it to sort of get the breakdown of, one, black students in these courses, but second, sort of um, how they're doing. Uh, in relation to the other students. So now we can look at, um, I, and, and I think that you posed a good question in regards to our um, students perhaps that are going to, let me go back a couple. I think uh, we got ahead. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. We're going sorry. back. Okay. I'm on slide 14. And it's because on the PowerPoint printouts, Dr. Baker, the titles are a little bit funky the way they got printed out, at least on my sheet. Yeah. Okay. So we were at, let's go back. Am I going forward or back again? Okay, James, you're gonna, you're, I'm just gonna hand this off to you. <laughs> okay, I'm on slide 13. 13. There we go. All right, let's reset here. So we looked at this visual in regards to um, our sixth graders. And so we're gonna now look at our seventh graders. So actually, let's take a look at the semester one achievement um, information. So if we can go to the next one, there we go. So we looked at, if you recall, we looked at grade five, we looked at grades, we looked at iReady. So now we wanna take a look at our current sixth graders and specifically we want to look at their abc rate at the end of semester one for math six accelerated so when we look at the data point we're looking at how are black students the black african-american students compared to all other students did at the end of this first semester so 73 percent of our black african-american students received a, a grade of either an a b or a c compared to 82% of all other students. So again, bringing your attention down to that dark teal. That dark teal is now, instead of the numerical value on the achievement report, we're actually looking at the grade. So we're, say, we're looking at how there is still, we still continue to see overall, there is a gap between our black African-American students compared to all other students. But when we hone in on who's receiving those A's and B's, we're starting to see a trend that we're seeing um, that there is there is a higher um, there's a higher percent of percentage of students and that are receiving an A compared to our Black African American students. I'm going to pause there to give you some time to just kind of think about that. So the gap is also within our accelerated math courses, the gap between black students and all other students. So there's yes. a gap across courses and grade levels, but also a gap between black students in the same course that's accelerated. Yes, yeah, so we're just looking at our accelerated correct, course correct. right now. Yep. Yes. Yep. Well, and, and again, I'm just highlighting, even within the accelerated courses, there's a gap. So on our next slide, we're moving on to our current seventh graders because we want to talk about their pathway into math. 
And for our current seventh graders, 91% of our seventh graders are enrolled in a, in a math accelerated course. And we have about 9% of seventh graders who are not enrolled in an accelerated math course. So we wanna just call out that percentages because again, the pathways are slightly different for our sixth graders compared to our seventh graders and then you're going to see our eighth graders. As Dr. Lund noted, this is the first year that we've offered accelerated math to all our students entering sixth grade. Um, specifically, I want to call out that our black African-American students, 12% um, of our seventh grade black African-American students are enrolled in a Math 7 accelerated course. And we have 22% of our black African-American seventh graders that are enrolled in a Math 7 course. Sorry, Dr. Maliwan. So it's not 22% of black students it's 22% of students are black. Yes. In the seventh grade, okay. Yes. So now let's look at how our seventh graders did after um, the first semester this year in regards to Math 7 Accelerated um, course. So when we look at their ABC rates, we are seeing that our black African-American students earned fewer ABs or C's after the first semester this year in Math 7 Accelerated. Um, so 62% of our black African-American students received either an A, B, or C, and 76% of all other students received the same uh, rating of an A, B, or C. So our, our gap here is about 14%. So overall, we're seeing that the gap is growing, um, and so this is something that, this would be a place where we want to monitor and be um, monitoring early on to, again, indicate those support systems that are needed um, early versus later. Quick question. Um, there's, there's definitely for sixth and seventh grade students that gap um, of uh, black African-American students um, so in both in both grades, about fifteen percent, a fifteen percent less students aren't earning grades. Uh, a, I'm sorry, A grades mm -hmm. in both grades. Um, so what is uh, being done differently this semester to uh, to change that? So that's part of what we discussed earlier in terms of when we're looking at student outcome data and what we want to monitor, we've called out some specific leading indicators that we have identified that are like highly correlated. But as Dr. Camarino shared, it's not just looking at one data point. We're also looking at, for example, um, different assessments um, or common assessments that we utilize that can inform us more in regards to perhaps um, it, more on the skills, what different assessments um, assess different skills. And so it's a combination of looking at different data points to indicate where is it that our students are struggling more and that is related specifically in this. What, what are your wonderings as to why the gap in sixth grade that's 8% is increased in seventh grade accelerated math to 14%, almost a 6% mm -hmm. increase. I know we're talking about two subsets of students, but any, any wonderings as to um, why there's an increase between sixth grade and seventh grade, uh, if ideally we want to be diminishing the mm -hmm. gaps, uh, mm -hmm. right, by the time they get to eighth grade or ninth grade algebra? I think as we get into our data that calls out some of the experiences that our current eighth graders have, um, had in the last couple of years. Um, I think it's going to give us some more of that context and um, qualitative data. And it's really around their experiences, their learning experiences the last couple of years, as well as the available data. And we have to also um, be very transparent that in the last couple of years, we had data that was available, that wasn't available, that historically has been available for us to be able to make some informed decisions um, at a at a more um, like at a at a more um, 
important time or just progress monitor quickly using these data points. And I'll just call out, um, not everyone has taken those high stake tests in the past couple of years. We're just starting to get into that tempo again of having those common assessments, the practices, as well as being able to progress monitor consistently. Um, so there's, I think there's a, a variety of factors that, that play into this, and that would be something that we would explore as a, as a team, as a district, and being able to identify. And that is actually the, the, that is the purpose of us having this, these board goals, to be able to yeah. do these check-ins throughout the year versus at the end of the year. Yeah. And ideally, that is the rationale for testing in March and not waiting till the end of the year because then we still have April, May, yes. and part of June to intervene appropriately. Yes, and to your point, we also have to acknowledge that within our system internally, we have established some really concrete ways to collaborate across different departments so that we are looking at the same data points, that we are having discussions around the professional development that is um, provided in our system, as well as um, the implementation of it across all our schools, regardless of the location of the school. So um, I think those are internal changes that are really important that we don't always highlight and mention, but that's like the work behind the scenes that um, everyone in this room can speak to. And um, just taking back to my first statement I ma made at the beginning of this presentation, that the data belongs to not one group or one person, it belongs to all of us. So we're all in this looking at it from different lenses, whether it's the lens of a, of a principal, a lens of a teacher leader, a district leader, it's really looking at the data in ways that perhaps we didn't look at in, in the past. So now we get to our current eighth and ninth graders. And I think, you know, this is a nice transition to um, your question, Dr. Benitez, because we're going to give some background in regards to their learning experiences. Um, this is a similar visual in regards to the um, paths that exist for our middle schoolers. Our current eighth graders, they had the um, accelerated path as well as the standard path that has been offered. So their experiences have been different in regards to um, their math experience in middle school, as well as our ninth graders. Um, so we want to move on to our next slide so we can give you a little bit of that, that background. So our current eighth graders were actually, and this is part of that data story where we talk about like what was happening besides like the numbers, like what is their data story? So a little bit of the qualitative data around our current eighth graders is that they were actually our fifth graders during the 2021 school year. Um, their experience was very different because they were actually um, participating in distance learning. Um, we can probably all agree that their learning experiences were different for a variety of reasons, whether those reasons had to do with being in school or not, or things that were going on in our communities. Um, as well as um, their experiences are different from previous students that entered middle school. And as a district, like all districts in the state as well as across the nation, um, our data that historically had been available for us to be able to utilize as um, ways to make decisions about um, offering certain classes or placements into classes wasn't as available as it was, as well as um, grades, they weren't available. So we have to call out these um, factors because they're important factors as we start digging into how they're currently doing. Um, and so as we look at how our current eighth graders are doing, we're going to focus on our eighth graders and their participation in math eight versus algebra. So when we look at this um, slide, we're really calling out the percent of students that in eighth grade that are currently participating, for example, in um, algebra in eighth grade. So we have 75% of our eighth graders are in algebra. And then we have 25% of our students in eighth grade that are taking math eight. Again, they had the two pathways that were available, um, which is different from our current sixth graders in middle school. And then looking further down, we see that our black African-American students um, 
we have about 11% of our current eighth graders who are black African-American participating in algebra. And um, we have approximately 17% that are participating in math eight. So I think you, Dr. Benitez, you had asked like the percentage in regards to black African-American students compared to all other students participation in algebra eight. So as we move into the next slide, we're looking at um, how are students doing currently, are current eighth graders doing in algebra compared to math A? So when we look at our black African-American students that are enrolled in algebra, 70% of them after the first semester received um, a grade of either an A, B, or C compared to 80% of all other students receiving that A, B, or C grade. When we look at math A, we see that 65% of our black African-American students are receiving an A, B, or C grade compared to 59% uh, of all other students. So in just looking at this data point, we're seeing that our African-American uh, black students are doing um, a little bit better than all other students as it pertains to math eight. So I'll pause here for you to take a moment to look at these data points. So if I can deduce from the last two slides, Dr. Madrigal, a smaller percentage of black students are in algebra in the eighth grade? Mm -hmm. Yes. But for those black students that are in math eight, a higher percentage is getting an A, B, or C. That is correct. So e even though there are disproportionately more black students in math eight? Yes. Okay. So just to call out some, some of the noticings that um, you shared now, um, there's also a few patterns to take note of. Um, we know that um, our gap, as we're looking at the gap across sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, when we look at our black African-American students compared to all other students, we're seeing that um, the gap is, is increasing. So just making note of that as we move on to look at our um, grade nine students. So now to our final group of students. These are our n current ninth graders. So for goal three, we also wanted to look at um, our current ninth graders and specifically of the current ninth graders, um, some of them took algebra last year as eighth graders and some are taking algebra this year as ninth graders. So in the next couple of slides, we're gonna explore um, some questions around um, their participation rate and their grades in regards to algebra. So we're gonna look at what percentage of current ninth graders completed algebra as eighth graders with an ABC uh, grade at the end of the school year, meaning the second semester. And for those ninth graders that are currently taking algebra, we will look at their ABC rate at the end of the first semester um, that just concluded in January. So let's take a look at algebra. So for our current, this slide is specific to last year. So ninth graders that took algebra last year as eighth graders, we see that our black African-American students had a slightly lower rate of a grade of a, in eighth grade of a A, B, or C rate at the end of the year last year compared to all other students. So. Uh, for example, 73% of our black African-American students in last year that took algebra got that A, B, or C. Compared to all other students, all other students, there was about 77% of them that received that A, B, or C um, rate, grade rating. Now when we look at our current ninth graders and we're looking at how are they doing in algebra this year. So just an important um, note to make is that not all ninth graders are within our system. So some of our ninth graders came from out of the district and perhaps algebra wasn't an option for them in middle school. So they may be taking algebra for the first time because that was that is the next course in their pathway. And then we also have our, our students that were in our system that didn't take algebra last year, but they are this year. So in, in looking at the data, we see that our African-American students had a higher rate of 
of a A, B, or C at the end of this first semester when they took algebra as ninth graders so compared to all other students. So it's about 5% higher. So I know I've provided a lot of data. I feel like I've taken you through the middle school journey and we're gonna, before we transition into goal four and we get into the, the, you know, the weeds of A through G, I want to pause to allow uh, for any questions, um, reflections that you'd like to share. So thank you, uh, Dr. Madrigal. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the big sort of wondering out uh, in the room. And, and I can only put this out because you've given us the data to be able to put it out. So if our ultimate goal as a district is to um, have students take algebra in either the eighth or ninth grade and be successful, get an A, B, or C, right, um, following our college and career readiness uh, approach. And in the sixth grade, uh, there's already a gap, right? And then we can go back and look at fifth grade indicators. And then in the seventh grade, the gap is widening. Again, two, two cohorts, but nonetheless, the snapshot in sixth grade is it's 8%, snapshot in seventh grade is it's 14%. Um, we all know and we've all shared and we've been presented that the biggest impact on student success happens in the classroom, all right? I'm a seventh grade teacher at Franklin Middle School. Um, what do I have at my disposal? What resources do I have? What support do I have? Um, what's in my wheelhouse uh, to be able to do something different, do something better, do more of knowing that the data, as you said, we're using it, it's everyone's data, I want to own this data. What am I going to do as a seventh grade teacher to both ensure student success, student learning, student mastery, and then be equitable in my grading uh, when I do that? Uh, at the same time, rec recognizing that I'm making up ground here, right? I'm not going to diminish. I'm not going to make up a 14% gap. I mean, that's the goal. Yes, we absolutely want to strive for that. Again, not to answer tonight, but to me, that's what really is going to matter when we do school site visits when we talk to teachers, when we ask teachers what they need for support, when we have teachers that come concerned and say, I have 20 students who want to make up missing work, uh, to me, it, it, that's, that's to me, what, what, when we use qualitative data, uh, what are we looking for in terms of those sparkles of light, sparkles mm -hmm. of hope, that then we can leverage and say, we all need to be doing what those teachers over here are doing, or what this success story over here is, uh, because that, that ultimately to me is, we can look at data and talk about data all day, but then how that translates back into what is changing either pedagogically, how are we centering pedagogically black students, are we teaching math differently to black students and students of color? All right, village education, uh, Dr. Baker. And what interventions there are at a teacher's disposal that is carrying a lot of the weight of trying to make up ground for what we already know to be the case in the fifth grade, and in many cases, third grade? Right, with our summative assessments. So not, not to answer tonight, but that's my big wondering, right? Not, not leaving it all to the seventh grade teacher to have to make up ground, because then in eighth grade or ninth grade, we already know that there's a disproportionate success rate uh, and both who's accessing algebra, but then who's getting an A, B, or C in algebra. So even though we default back in the ninth grade to an A through G track, our black students are disproportionately carrying the burden of our system and in this district, and then it's in the teacher's hands, all uh, right, if we, if we all know and value the impact that teachers have in the classroom. So th that's my big wondering, right? And, and I'd love to hear um, when, 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 we're, when this data then gets translated back, you know, I don't know if it's I ILTs or department teams, what are we doing to make sure that teachers have everything that they need at their disposal to make that huge impact, right, in sixth, seventh grade? Uh, Dr. Benitez, I appreciate your question. A couple things just right off the bat that comes to mind is this year our teachers are engaged in professional development. Uh, we, our math teachers in particular have four full days of professional development. Most subjects have two, but we prioritize both ELA and math with four full days of training. 
You might recall from a video that was shared several months ago in our board meeting regarding a, a showcase of a teacher at Jefferson, Karina Rodriguez, uh, that was elevating a practice that we are piloting as a district called Building Thinking Classrooms, which is really a, a real flip in how we teach mathematics. Mm -hmm. No longer is it just, you know, teacher up front, sage on the stage, imparting math knowledge to students. It is students up at whiteboards, working collaboratively and generally in groups of two or three, working through complex math tasks, uh, working in different groups every single day um, to really challenge, if you will, some of those preconceptions on who's good at math and who's not good at math. Uh, so that randomization of groups, and then really uplifting uh, a, a total shift in note taking so that students, Karina uh, uses the term, and Allison Akeo does this at Marshall as well, of notes to my future self. And every student's notes looks different, but it's done after the learning. So they capture their learning after rather than prior to completing a task. Uh, so it really is a, a flip in the way we elevate math instruction. It is a much more engaging approach, much more culturally responsive approach. Um, there's more work to be done in that area, so I'm not going to say that it's perfect. Um, but we are actually, one of the contracts that you approved recently is to actually bring out the author of the text who's doing some direct training with our teachers uh, starting at the end of this month with our first group, actually next week. Uh, that will continue through May. And then uh, a separate training in June, uh, five full days of training for middle and high school teachers that were piloting the use of that text directly with the author. So I think that's going to show some promising practices. Uh, we have revised our unit guides as well. There is a new um, state adopted curriculum coming out next year for mathematics. We have a new framework this year. Uh, we have a focus group that is cross level working on what shifts need to occur TK to 12 in mathematical teaching uh, to really develop a new pedagogy um, that we can stand on across levels as well. Because I will admit that our elementary curriculum looks very different than our secondary curriculum currently in mathematics. So we're looking at what, what practices we can align K to 12 uh, based on the new framework. What grade does Gigi go up to? Uh, Gigi's used through fifth grade. Okay. I think you're noticing also um, speaks to much more precision which, with how the pandemic has harmed student learning. And so I'm appreciating just the, back to the word precision, the precision with which our level offices and their work with principals and teachers can also think differently around the interventions and supports with the new pedagogy that's coming in, but also with tutoring and things that are accessible to all students because in the meantime, as we're working towards the goals, there are students right there that need those supports because they lost foundational elements of math instruction during the pandemic. And so there is a, there's a whole system alignment that needs to happen with math and English instruction. And also we need to attend to, and, and we can now because there's precision with these results, we can attend more to specific groups of students at grade levels and their needs. I'd just like to add, since the pandemic too, all of our schools have engaged in an equity dilemma question, which really has rooted into the experiences of our students of color, looking at the data that has opened up the conversation to really look at intrinsically and in a mirror, their teaching practices with our students of color and walking classrooms with each other, internal learning walks that our schools have done, with the with, with at heart the equity dilemma question of what am I doing with my African American students in my classrooms for whatever the data sets are, so looking at that as a site to now having outside visitors, which is our district folks coming in to visit classrooms on our what we call our QCV quality quality core visits, and highlighting the last three years of their equity dilemma question in that. So there's conversations, release time w amongst the teams to have those discussions, to look in the data and also use those unit guides to know what interventions and what kind of acceleration they need to do with their students. There's been a lot of conversation at our schools with the, with the actual teachers themselves leading the, the conversations. I would also add that when we think about math, it's also, there's been a lot of conversation as well around um, how students see themselves as mathematicians, that, that mathematical, like their disposition, especially at the elementary level um, for our black and brown students, um, having them 
see themselves as math mathematicians and having that mindset that um, math is something that all students can do. Um, but again, it has to do with those dispositions earlier than middle school and discussing what does that mathematician look like, sound like, and sounding like meaning the ability to use mathematical discourse, um, that inquiry-based uh, question or questioning that happens in classrooms at a much earlier time versus later and knowing um, th and there's a great work happening in our system and I think um, Dr. Lund can speak to as well at Grant Elementary with the great first eight some of the work that they're doing around how students um, really engage themselves and center themselves in what they're learning and that integration of the core subjects. So now we're transitioning to goal four. Yes. Um, is do we have data that says that this approach has worked in other places or <clears throat> excuse me is this stuff so complicated and new and whatnot that we don't know for sure but we historically know that uh, that if we do these kinds of things they're successful so our research team has looked at data specific to um, algebra um, being offered in middle schools and looking at other uh, large urban districts and uh, what is the success rate for students, especially students of color that participate in these courses. And um, the key findings really center around, it's not so much the offering of the class, is it's identifying the support systems that have to happen early on. And, and I, I believe Dr. Lund and Dr. Camarino spoke about the if a student is not doing well let's say in one of the accelerated in sixth grade accelerated math what do we have in our system to early on provide that support versus making a decision that the student now goes to math seven versus giving them the opportunity to continue so the research is clear that support systems that are very clear have to be in place and that they're measured um, in each of the, um, like in our case, when we're progress monitoring data. What I'd like to add, Mr. Otto, also is that we have found that, you know, just so we know, Math 8 is a grade level standard that a lot of our schools, when Common Core was enacted, is rigorous. And it's something that a lot of our schools, a lot of our students find challenging to be in Math 8. So just because you're in Math 8 doesn't mean you're not in a rigorous classroom. It is at, at, at eighth grade level. We have students that go to CAMS from other districts that have not had algebra, right, and have to have to go to CAMS without having had algebra in their school district. What we want to say, though, is that every time we offer some type of an accelerated program, whether it's algebra in, in middle school or AP or honors courses in high school, we want to make sure we have access to all of our students in, that, in those programs. So what we know is whatever we offer, we want to give our students the best opportunity to excel in our accelerated programs, whether it's honors, whether it's AP, or whether it's algebra and dual enrollment for sure yes okay i won't belabor the point okay so we will transition now to goal four which is our co uh, college and career readiness and i want to give some context in regards to goal four so the state measures college and career readiness utilizing a variety of metrics um, for example college coursework uh, typically known as dual enrollment the AP pass rate, the CTE pathway completion. But for the purpose of our goal, we are only going to look at one of those metrics that the state looks at, and that is college. Um, we're going to look at the A through G uh, requirements. So college for, um, I'm sorry, goal for college and career readiness states in pursuit of having more than 66% of black African-American graduating seniors A through G eligible the proficiency gap between black African-American students and all other stu students will decline from 15% in June 2023 to 0% in June 2028. So to give some context around A through G, A through G is a requirement that's put in place to qualify admission to the UC system as well as the CSU. So UC University of California and USC California State University. Although 
it's not the post-graduation path for all students. As a system, we want to um, equitably provide that opportunity for all our students, and that is why we focused on our A through G, because we want that to be an option for all. And so for the um, leading indicators, we have listed grade eight, English and math grades, I ready percentage on or above grade level. Another leading indicator that we will look at is grade nine through 11 on track for A through G and current grade 12 on track for A through G. Our cohort for this uh, goal is our current eighth graders. And like goal one and three, we have, um, we have a targeted cohort that we're going to follow in the next couple years. And with a target goal, as mentioned, that 66% of graduating seniors um, will graduate meeting the A through G eligibility with 0% gap between black African-American students and all other students. So this just gives you that visual of how we're, when we're going to be monitoring. And the cohort, as I mentioned, is currently in eighth grade. So we wanna take a look at how are they doing currently in their English and math courses. So this is as of, at, at the end of semester one, we analyzed the English ABC rate. Um, it's, and so we looked at our black African-American students and 76% of our current eighth graders who are black African-American received um, an A, B or C grade compared to 79% of all other students. So there's a 3% gap there in regards to our uh, current eighth graders as it pertains to their English class. When we look at math, our black African-American students, 70% of our black African-American students received an A, B, or C grade in math compared to 75% of all other students. So again, there's that 5%, there's a gap there of 5%. And so we want to make sure that we continue to keep an eye on those gaps that we're seeing and in looking at grades, specifically the number of A's that are issued to black African-American students compared to others as well as the B's, but not losing track that we also need to look at the, the D and the F uh, percentage because that is also a an in early, that's an indicator for us to have some early intervention and support in place. Now moving away from our target cohort of grade eight students, we can begin to look at the data for the high school grade levels, which are nine, 10, 11, and 12th grade. Um, we'll continue to look at achievement through grades, but it'll be in a combined way as we explore students that are on track to meet the A through G requirements at the different grade levels. So this visual is intended to, I'm going to hone in on ninth grade, and this visual is intended to just give you an understanding of how we measure on track for each of the grade levels. And I'll get into the specificity of how we measure for each in the next slide. But let's take a look at ninth grade because our ninth grade on track percentage has for A through G is actually our highest um, grade level that has that, that um, high on track percentage. When we look at our ninth graders, we are really looking at on track being English, whether they are on track in English or math. That's not to say that our ninth graders are not meeting any of the other A through G courses. We actually encourage our students to take as many A through G courses starting in ninth grade because it is a, uh, the, it's a total of 15 courses throughout the four years that they're in high school. Um, so for example, we measure on track for English because we require, as well as the CSU and the UCs require four years of English. So imagine if a student is in ninth grade and we're not, um, keep, we're not monitoring that on track in English, then we're not able to offer immediately a way to, for them to make up that, let's say that fail in English early on. And we know that being on track in ninth grade is a, is an indicator if our students are, we have a higher percentage that are on track in ninth grade, 
the likelihood of them meeting that A through G requirement by the time they get to ninth grade is high. So ninth grade is definitely a focus for us for English and math. Why math? Math is, a, uh, we, the state requires, or state schools require three years, but as a district, we require four years of math. So again, those two, we're, measure, we're measuring the on track in ninth grade. So let's look now specifically at each of the grade levels and what do we measure in each of them when we're looking at on track versus off track. So in ninth grade, I've called out English and math, but as I said, student can be taking, for example, a VAPA course, lang world languages in ninth grade. In 10th grade, in addition to English and math, we're also looking at on track for um, history. So an example would be like modern history. So we were adding additional courses that are A through G in 10th grade. And then if you look at the visual, it has an orange box to indicate the course that we're adding in regards to on track um, for A through G. So when we look at 11th grade, now we're looking at additional courses um, we've added, we had English, math, history, there might be a science. Um, now we're looking in 12th grade, we're looking at everything. And keep in mind that pathways at different high schools, students may take, for example, uh, we're looking at uh, science in 11th grade, but if you start in a school that it's heavy in science, you might meet that A through G earlier than in another um, high school. So it really depends on the option that the student has selected uh, for their high school experience. And we, just to make note also, we are currently in research in the process of revisiting the way we measure on track and the requirements so that there's alignment to what the state is measuring for A through G, as well as our internal um, systems at our high schools, as well as what we use to measure that on track, off track. So that's in the process um, with the goal of us being able to make sure that that's aligned and um, schools can utilize that and be able to say that it has 100% accuracy when we're looking at that on track, off track. <coughs> So this visual here was provided at the beginning of the year when we reviewed actually our summative data from last year. And this visual really gives you that um, understanding around, for example, our ninth graders last year, how many of them were on track after the first semester last year compared to this year. So when we look at last year, 59% of our black African American ninth graders were on track at the end of their um, first semester. So A through G, meeting that A through G requirement of the math and English. 67% of all other students last year at the end of semester one were at meeting the A through G requirement. So fast forward to this year when we're looking at, um, for example, um, A through G for 12th graders, now we're looking at 12th graders last year compared to where they are now. So last year, after the first semester, 12th grade, 12th graders are black African-American students, 44% of them were meeting that A through G requirement, compared to 58% um, of all other students in 12th grade had met that A through G requirement after the first semester. Um, why 12th grade? Because in 12th grade, we are now measuring all a through G requirements is being on track. Um, and this year, at the end of our first semester, our black African-American students, 46% of them, were approximately meeting the A through G requirements compared to um, all other students that were meeting it at 55%. So we've come to the last slide, and so I wanna also again give an opportunity to pause here um, for any additional questions and Really, we've gone through this journey of progress monitoring with our first and second goal last month, and now we have just completed monitoring uh, board goal three and four, and it's our, our first round of doing our progress monitoring. So it's really an opportunity for us as a team to reflect on the data. We've had really good questions and um, reflection around how our, our black African-American students are doing as uh, compared to other um, students. Um, so I will pause here and 
and welcome any questions or reflections. Thank you, Dr. Madrigal. Um, so I think one of the things that's implicit, I don't know if I saw it explicitly on any of the slides, but we're using C or better as a grade to, to determine whether you're A through G on track. That's correct, right? That is yeah. correct. Okay. Uh, it might, might be good in one of the slides or somewhere to just say, here, here's the determining you know, factor on, on what, what we're using to determine on track, A through G. Well, first that they have to be in an A through G course, then that they're getting a C or better in that. Uh, because that's, that's the minimum eligibility that's required for the CSU. And you had a huge slip, Dr. Madrigal. I was going to call you out. You actually said USC. Did I say USC? Yeah, you, oh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> <When you said. laughs> I know um, there's a lot of USC <laughs> folks in here, but I'm more of a UCLA Yeah, I was waiting fan. for one of them to, like, look up or say something, but okay. She said, <laughs> yeah. she said it right. She said it right. Dr. Brown is giving me the look, so. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my question is, um, given that not every but many of our courses do fulfill the A through G requirement, uh, and it varies from pathway to pathway, high school to high school. Uh, what ensures, or who ensures, maybe is a better question, that if and when a student either takes a class that's not fulfilling the A through G requirement, or um, takes a course but doesn't get a C or better, uh, to ensure that they stay on track, who's monitoring, helping, stepping in to say to a student, hey, you're two classes off, or hey, you may want to consider taking this class instead of this other class, uh, because as we all know, it's very difficult to navigate the A through G requirements, right? So who, who's, who's, uh, who do we hold accountable for that, Dr. Camarino? So luckily, uh, we have a system that was established through re the research department and the high school office at the time called the GUS system that is in, in our research department that immediately pulls up where students are, and it's visually uh, accessible, and you can see it right off the bat of where, where they are. Our counselors work really closely with our students on ensuring that they're going through the A, G A through G track, so it's visually av available to them, and they're looked at at every semester. Grades are posted and counselors get a uh, data report of all those students who are not A through G knowing that they need to develop either a course sequence for them for summer school if needed, or APEX course if needed, but all that is uh, designed for them and uh, reports are given to them through our Elroy system. So, but, but someone still needs to talk to this person named Gus. The counselors <laughs> do. So it's the counselors. Our yeah. counselors uh, look at that and determine the, the students' course sequences. Okay. It's a really important question also because something that has um, been a part of the work of the last couple of years is concurrent credit recovery and not only waiting until summer school. And while summer school is a great opportunity for students to make up credit, so is concurrent. And so Dr. Camarena mentioned APEX. It's one way that students can take the second semester but recover the credit for the first semester at the same time with support. Yeah. Where, where does one go to find out more or get support for that, Dr. Camarino? The counselors have meetings with parents as, as we go out now to discuss our, with our eighth grade students now that have been accepted to their high schools. That conversation starts to be had even there with our parents and students to let them know the course sequences and the options that there are for students when they need support. But, but if I'm a parent, let's say right now about an 11th grader and I'm trying to figure this out and I'm hearing the buzz about... Uh, you, know, you know, in the 11th grade college applications, students coming to board meetings, talking about going to UCLA instead of Berkeley. Where, where do I as a parent or as a student go, uh, given that we've also heard that it's, you know, sometimes challenging to get appointments with counselors right. and that. So where, where can we go for that? Students always get, and, and, it, and um, I know Axel can speak to this too, as they go to their next level, they, ha they set counselor appointments where they actually get to choose the courses that they need, and based on their criteria of what courses they have, they can either, either have an opportunity during those elective courses, elective sections, to do makeup courses, or accelerate even more by taking some other courses, whether dual enrollment, APEX, and or uh, AP courses. Yeah, Axel, explain from a student perspective, like starting in ninth grade, how you know that you're on track. What are the resources that you use? Who do you talk to if, you, if you're wondering, like, oh, did I go off track? Or, and if not you, it might be a peer, that because we know you are on track. Um, usually, if we know we're on track for A through G requirements, our counselors usually set up an appointment for that. 
and also our counselors come into the classroom and offer and tell us what the requirements for A through G is. And we can also look at our transcript to see what we are missing, because that's also on our transcript as well. But yeah. and, and who do you go to for questions when you're in doubt, uh, Axel? Our counselors. Okay. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? That was pretty awesome in one night. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Thank, thank you, you so much, much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Montenegal. I'm also thinking just as these are all learning experiences for us as a board, thank you for being learners, lead learners for our district. And I'm also just thinking about there's so much, um, there's so much that could be talked about in schools effort. So we'll just want to continue to think about do we bring schools in? Do we follow up with some of the responses that our schools and level offices and others are making when they see this data? What does data analysis look like at the school level? So I, kn I know we'll be alive with thinking about how to bring back um, other elements of programming and response to this data, not necessarily tonight, but just a great learning experience for all of us. So thank you for your good engagement. Thank you. Okay, all good stuff all, all the way around. Do you want to take a break? Like a. Sorry. Oh, um, you know what? Let's take a real quick break. Let's see if we can manage to be back Six here at 7:30. We'll just have a little okay. chance to stretch and. Yeah. Because um, uh, we still have more to go. Quick break. I think that's probably a record for us. So we are back. Um, we are on track on our agenda for um, new business. So we'll take a look at 16.1, approval of the tentative agreement and four MOUs between the Teachers Association of Long Beach and the Long Beach Unified School District. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? I um, 16.5, approval of the um, board policy. Um, oh, we're doing one at, oh. Um, yes, because this is, okay, this is yes. under new business, so um, yes, we're yes. doing 16.1. Okay. And so is there any discussion on 16.1? On yeah, I, I understood that Cal passed this with over 90% of the vote. So um, uh, that's great. I think you're a couple percentage points off, Dr. Otto. We actually had with our uh, K-12, TK-12 unit, they passed at an 88% rate, and our CDC Head Start was at 100% rate. By the way, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other discussion on that one? So this is a big deal. Let's hear a little bit about uh, how we got here. Well, what, first what of came all, out of this? I think it's a, a, a testament to the collaboration between both bargaining teams because we had very good, healthy conversations about the needs from both sides, our needs to really move forward the work with our excellence, equity, and ethics policy and vision 2035, and also hearing from our teachers some of the things that they needed. And what was really nice is there was an overall support where we're moving. It was just trying to find that medium of how we get there and laying out that roadmap. And I think people were also appreciative of our ability to offer them a, a competitive raise as well. I think that was a nice part for this, this process. Well, truly a win, truly a win. Okay, any further discussion? Um, then I'll ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 4 0. Thank you. Uh, next, we have item 16.2 approval of compensation for management and non represented employees. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? I'll have our board secretary take a roll call vote. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. That passes 4 0. 
Uh, thank you. Next, we have item 16.3, approval of chief business and financial officer employment contract. Move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? I'll ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. That passes 4 0. Thank you. Um, item 16.4, board policy 5144.1, suspension, and this is for information only. So we'll, um, we'll listen to our presentation. All right, well, good evening, everybody. So we are we we'll be happy to come and uh, talk to you about a revision to our board policy for suspensions. Um, and why are we, are we updating this? Well, several reasons. First, uh, to be in line with our uh, equity and excellence policy. Um, and also as a, in alignment with our aspiration to be an equitable system focused on excellence for all. Um, but additionally, there were some updates to or some changes to some um, legislation that were prompted by Senate Bill 274 that are prompting some of these updates to our board policy. So specifically, the policy um, aims to, process, to have a process where students are treated fairly and equitably um, in all of our Long Beach Unified School District schools. Um, and so the change specifically is um, to remove the suspension code um, for disruption or willful defiance for grades K through 12. Previously, um, students in kindergarten through eighth grade could not be suspended solely for um, disruption and willful defiance. So the Senate bill extends that through grades 12. Um, of course, um, the provision where a teacher can continue to suspend from their class um, continues to be in effect. So teachers can continue to suspend for willful defiance. This takes effect starting July 1st, 2024. Um, so we are updating this policy in anticipation of that time. Um, and one of the most exciting parts of this policy is that we were able to hear from students. So um, Viva Moji um, was able to engage students and we were able to hear some of their feedback about the policy. Um, and so some of the things that you know, we like to uplift is that you know, we were able to hear the perspectives uh, of how the policies are being implemented as they as I see them in our schools. Um, and so they talked about wanting more clarity um, regarding um, what the rules are for suspensions and discipline in general. Um, and the thing that they thought was really important and we agreed is that we should have a policy that compels district staff to take action when there are inconsistency in implementation in our schools. So no matter which school they go to or which class they are in, students should expect to have the same expectations and the same implementation of our policy. Um, and one of the things that is also um, really important that we like to convey is that suspension is something that is used only after other means of correction have been attempted and they have failed, but we always try other means of correction first. So Dr. Prelo and I are here available to answer um, any questions you might have about this policy. Do we have any questions or comments, Dr. Benitez? Yeah, I'll just share. Um, what we have been able to share and what I've shared in our advisory group uh, meetings, and, and it's around more um, how the spirit of the policy gets implemented through our uh, administrative regulations. Yes. And I just kind of want to highlight um, three, three areas that you've referenced, but I, I want to make sure that we uphold that part of the policy. One is consistency around how suspensions are applied, uh, right? And, and we, we've done a lot of work on the disproportionate number of students of color that get suspended, disproportionate number of disciplinary actions taken. Uh, and in some cases, 
Um, girls of color, uh, right, that, that um, you, you reference already the consistency. The second, to me, is around um, the student experience. What happens to students uh, with regard to in-school suspensions? Mm -hmm. So we've heard from students, right, that there are disparate experiences when a student gets an in-school suspension. What are they doing? Who, you know, whose classroom they're in? Uh, sort of the overall experience. And then the last you referenced is even though teachers are still able to uh, do this pursuant at code uh, 48900, um, what kind of guardrails uh, can we uh, implement as a school district so that there's consistency, transparency, and at the end of the day, the goal here is for us never to suspend any students, right? To keep students in school learning. So I just wanted to lift that up as you develop the ARs uh, that will align uh, with the policy. Definitely. Do we have any other questions or comments? No. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're ready to move on to the next item. And that would be approval of board policy 5121, grades and evaluation of student achievement. So this Move is to approve. Second. Any discussion? Yes, I um so I, I know at the last board meeting, I raised my concerns with um, some of the language. I think there's two areas that I'm uh, still very concerned. Um, and that's that whenever a stu student misses an assignment or assessment due to either um, an excused or unexcused absence, they will be given full credit. Um, I think that the unexcused Absence is where I um, have a problem. I think we have counselors, uh, teachers, when there's a situation where the student absolutely needed, uh, wasn't in class for, for a reason that was not excused. I think that there's always that opportunity for the students to speak to their teachers directly. Now the other thing that is super concerning is that it, al it also has a language that a uh, a grade assigned by the teacher shall not be changed by the board or the superintendent except as provided by law. Um, board policy or administrative regulation. So I think that the board should have the ultimate say in changing a grade. Unless I'm misinterpreting that, um, that could be clarified by, um, by legal. Um, so those two things, if that's clarified, I like clarification there, but the unexcused uh, absences, I think is still a problem. And um, I guess I like, does the unexcused to be changed, if possible? So Ms. Lopez, are you gonna answer the legal question, Wayne? Okay. Yeah. So Education Code 49066 is uh, the law that talks about grade changing. And I'll just read it because it makes sense when you read it. Yeah. Uh, when grades are given for any course of instruction taught in a school district, the grade given to each pupil shall be the grade determined by the teacher of the course and the determination of the pupil's grade by the teacher in the absence of clerical or mechanical mistake, fraud, bad faith, or incompetency, incompetency shall be final. And then the section B of that law says the governing board of the school district and the superintendent of such district shall not order a pupil's grade to be changed unless the teacher who has determined such grade is, to the extent practicable, practicable given the, an opportunity to state orally, in writing, or both, the reasons for which the grade was given and is, to the extent practicable, included in all discussions relating to the changing of such grade. So that's the law, and that's what we refer to. So <clears throat> what that comes down to is there are a couple of provisions for the board to change a grade, but I'll tell you, um, in the last 10 years or so, I think that's come before the board maybe twice, and um, in both cases we upheld the grade that was given by the teacher. So it doesn't come up very often, and it's very helpful to have those legal parameters handy 
while, while we're having the discussion because basically um, we respect the teacher's um, grades that are given to the students except in those very few cases. Yeah, in legislative notes on this law, the main idea is exactly that, is that the teachers are the day-to-day -day, uh, reviewers, and so their grades should stand unless there's particularly a difficult, like we've got bad faith, fraud, mistake, obviously, in those situations. But to change a grade, for a board to be able to change a grade has to go through at least a process with the teacher because the teacher should be the one who's making the final grade. Absolutely, but I still think that there would be some, I, that's why the law is written that way, uh, I suppose, because there's going to be those uh, times when that grade will be challenged and will come to the board. Um, so if that's clear with the law, I think that uh, just my concern here in this policy then becomes the unexcused absences. So I have, a, just to, for clarification, Ms. Lopez, are you suggesting that a student that has an unexcused absence shall not be uh, given an opportunity to make up work? I just said that in those cases, there, there are going to be exemptions where you can, the student can go, uh, exceptions, I'm sorry, where the student can go talk to their teacher, to their counselor. Uh, but this is really, I mean, if a kid has 50 unexcused, abs uh, unexcused absences, then they are going to be entitled to do everything for full credit. They'll have the opportunity. Correct. That doesn't mean that they will receive full credit if it they don't. It does. This it says it's for full credit. Yeah, they'll have the opportunity if they had an absence. So I just want to be clear. You, you want a policy that does not allow for a student with an unexcused absence to make up work? No, they should be able to make up work. The language here is for full credit, and think that that's the key, Dr. Benitez. So full credit. Am I, and am, am I reading this correctly, Ms. Mogi, that they'll have the opportunity to receive full credit? versus that they will automatically receive full credit? It's the, it's the former that you just mentioned. That they'll have the opportunity to receive full credit, right? Does it guarantee that they'll, I mean, if they don't do the work, they're not gonna receive full credit, right? I mean, that, that's, my, that's how I'm reading the policy. But it also reads subsequent satisfactory completion of the assignment yeah. or assessment yeah. is followed by that. Okay, I just wanna be clear, thank you. Okay, um, is there any further discussion? on this grading policy? Well, I would just like to mention that we've received um, a lot of feedback from parents of our uh, special ed kids, and <clears throat> I'll just read a couple of quotes. Um, one parent said, um, this grading policy is a huge step towards equity in grading uh, beneficial to all LBUSD students. and." Also, the system we have now is not fair for a lot of kids, but especially students with disabilities. And so, in other words, the, the current um, grading system that we have now it is actually harmful to uh, <clears throat> a demographic of our students, but uh, this new policy won't be taking away anything from anyone, but it does validate our neurodiverse and vulnerable students. So I thought that would be important to add because we are actually um, creating this very inclusive policy which aligns with our um, excellence and equity uh, policy where we ground all our work. Uh, all that and I too. just want to say that I definitely agree. I think this is going to help many of our students. Um, I think we need to do something different. The only thing is, again, I was looking at the students who um, are constantly missing class, you know, have unexcused absences, and not the kids that, for good reasons, miss class, but students who are constantly missing class, and now they have this op opportunity to submit, which is great, an assignment for full-on credit. Um, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful, I think it's great. I'm looking at two, and I, and I know I brought this up at the last board meeting, that impact is going to have on the teachers in the, um, in the classroom that are now going back to correcting all of missed assignments, assessments, um, and the kids are gonna get full credit. So I think that, uh, again, the, the idea is, is a great idea, 
and um, I just thought the unexcused absences were something uh, was an area where teachers could directly speak to the students and to counselors but I see what you're trying to do it's like in every, every classroom every school this is what we're um, what we're trying to implement Mr. Otto yeah I mean the way I read it or at least the way that I heard it was that um, if somebody wants to submit never submitted an assignment and uh, then decided to submit them all then the teacher would have an opportunity to evaluate that and give them full credit or no credit or whatever depending on the work and uh, <clears throat> and I think it leaves the discretion with the teacher which is the way it should be so I'm, I'm not concerned about the language Dr. Brown the issue of absences is something that we've talked a lot about around grading with the idea that many times the impact for absence is much more significant than we intend it to be. And the idea of unexcused absences is particularly important when we think about our students who have the most vulnerable circumstances because there's a lot of reasons why an absence might be unexcused that is not just the student deciding not to go to class. So many of the circumstances, the testimonial, the student input that we received, as well as the educator input, indicates that sometimes the students who have the most unexcused absences need the most support and therefore the most scaffolding and assistance to be able to make up work. So just the idea of clearing an absence implies a very intentional home with a very intentional caregiver who is taking the time to clear those. And that is not the circumstance for many of our students. Thank you for reminding us that our students come from all kinds of different backgrounds and different homes and we need to be here <coughs> to support um, all of our students. Uh, yeah, oh. Axel. Um, I just wanted to ask like uh, a question for the record. Uh, we are asking the board to approve the guidelines for which the grading policy will be built on, right? What we're, what we're asking the board to do tonight is to approve the policy and the big picture. Mm -hmm. And from that policy, guidelines or regulations will be built uh, based on the, the guidance of the board here improving this, this policy. Okay, so um, what we approve tonight is going to be trickled down into uh, what will be the future grading policy for students, correct? It, it is the grading policy. How it will be executed, how it will be used will be uh, the trickle down part. Okay. Yeah. And to be clear, we don't review or vote on the regulations. And that's what's, yeah, that's where, you know, the separated by, uh, um, it's the way it should be, I think, that uh, uh, we don't want to run this district. And uh, so what this does is we say this is what we're, what the policy is, and then the administration comes up with regulations to, ad to administer our policy. Right, we, we provide the framework. And, and the values that anchor the policy, Axel, are the values around consistency, transparency, and fairness uh, that then the administrative regulations will uphold. And I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez. So based on the presentation that we had earlier, um, it is clear that uh, we need um, to help students, uh, marginalized populations, uh, increase in their grading, help them. And so for that reason, I am going to vote yes, uh, being very clear that I strongly believe that unexcused absences um, you know, may not always necessarily merit a full credit. Member Otto. Uh, aye. President Craighead. Aye. Member Benitez. Aye. 
And student member Aguilar, preferential vote? Aye. Thank you, that passes 4-0. Thank you. Uh, next we have item 16.6, .6, approval of pre-qualified lease, lease back, general contractors for preliminary and construction services. Move approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, my only discussion is that um, I think it's a great process. We've gone and found, created the same type of system for general contractors that we do for lots of other contractors that do things here. The only, my only uh, regret is that we've had uh, Mr. Rising here all night and uh, there's nothing to say except that they're doing a good job. Yes. We have Dana here, so Dana, you wanna <laughs> talk a little bit about this item? Uh, thank you guys for uh, making me feel so welcome so late into the evening. Um, <laughs> so we uh, we just completed, this is kind of the last of our pre-qualification of services for the next two to three years as we go through our next phase of projects. Uh, we qualifying 11 firms tonight, four of which are new to Long Beach Unified School District. We did an extensive process uh, utilizing the 16 uh, scoring categories that you guys approved back on February 21st, uh, of which we are... Um, uh, ensured that our community workforce development agreement, that the, um, the local outreach, as well as the personnel within those uh, different firms had local uh, staff that could cater to Long Beach. So many of these firms actually have not just city of Long Beach residents, but Long Beach Unified School District personnel on their staff. Thank you, and <clears throat> I will just add um, welcome to our public meeting and um, thank you for filling in for Mr. Miranda. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions or discussion? Great. Thank you. Then I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And student member Aguilar preferential vote? Aye. Thank you, that passes 4-0. Thank you. Um, and next we are at report of board members, so we will start with our student board member. Well, first off, I would just like to say uh, congratulations to Jordan High School for making a successful trip to New York City. Um, they played at Carnegie Hall, and I know that they had a lot of fun there, and I just know that they had a once in a lifetime experience that they will remember for the rest of their lives. And honestly, I hope that we can keep bringing back these opportunities to not only Jordan, but to other schools as well. And then I also wanted to shout out all of the high schools tomorrow, which uh, tomorrow will be their open house. So if you guys are listening out there, if you guys have students in the district, please make sure to go to your students open house and have a good night. <laughs> Thank you, Axel. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, we have open houses going on uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So unfortunately, we were here tonight. We couldn't make it out to open houses. So apologies for not being able to be at open houses. Uh, but we wish everyone a wonderful time on our campuses, getting to know the work that students are doing, uh, all the exciting stuff that's going on. The buzz is really high right now because we're only, how many weeks away from, for the end of the school year, Dr. Baker? Eight, nine, okay. That's right, that's right. Uh, so thank you uh, to all the schools uh, tonight, yesterday, and tomorrow night uh, for their open house events. And uh, appreciation for folks that um, reached out to us about agenda items on this meeting. Uh, President Craighead referenced, um, we did get a lot of emails on our grading uh, policy. Um, and on other things uh, that are going on, the business of the district. So um, stay engaged, stay vigilant. Um, if you're not able to make it out to public comment, appreciate the folks that can and, and do make public comment. Uh, but you can still reach out to us and communicate with us. So we just want to acknowledge that, at least from my end, I'm not able to respond to every single email that we got today. Uh, but um, we certainly read them, and they certainly um, influence the way we uh, think about the business of the district. So thanks to everyone that reached out. Thank you, Mr. Otto. 
congratulate Jordan High School for what they did in New York City. I had the privilege of attending, and uh, it was a magnificent concert. Uh, it uh, uh, both had uh, a vocal component and, and really, really much separate from the symphonic uh, uh, part, and uh, we, had, we had great seats, and uh, you could just see on the faces of the students and the performers that they were having the time of their life. Uh, who gets to play in Carnegie Hall? Not very many uh, people or uh, much less students. So it was just uh, a real accomplishment for Long Beach, a real accomplishment for Jordan. And uh, I, was, I felt privileged to be there. And uh, so that's first. Um, it is hard to imagine that there's only a little over two months left of the school year. It seems like, where did it go? And it's going to just accelerate uh, from here. Um, uh, one, one of the things that I did when I was in New York was participate with the California School Board Association on advocacy meetings with, uh, with Diana Craighead to um, uh, both the um, uh, bo both uh, first um, council, council uh, assembly member Gonzalez and then um, State Senator Lowenthal. Or is it the opposite? It's the opposite. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's Senator Gonzalez and Assemblymember Lowenthal about the things that are going on in the legislature. I thought it was very instructive and helpful. Uh, we talked about um, the things that are important to CSBA. I think we talked about the things that were important also to um, uh, the, the senator and the assembly member. And so uh, that was... Uh, uh, very helpful and our continuing involvement at the policy level at a statewide level is is a very good thing to do and we're, we've accelerated the doing of that and from there I mean one of the reasons that I was there was because I was on my way to the Council of Great City Schools conference in Washington DC which was I thought fabulous in fact if you would have seen the, the I, I want to say um, booklet that uh, they gave us that was about 400 pages of uh, things that have been going on and education issues and whatnot. Um, and that has nothing, not, shouldn't be confused with the about 400 pages of stuff we got in an in email uh, because uh, Jill's on the executive board, I'm a delegate, so I get to see all of that stuff. And I think they do a terrific job. It informs what we do. Um, I've had conversations with other uh, board members from other places and get ideas from them, and the opportunity to do that is just um, uh, terrific. And, um, and so uh, that was uh, great. I wish my plane had been delayed for three hours coming back, but um, <clears throat> you can probably hear that in my voice. But, uh, but we got back, and uh, it was a very successful trip all the way around, so good. Thank you. Ms. Lopez? Yes, um, congratulations to all the students who, um, who are accepted to the middle or high school program of their choice. Um, you deserve to be in a program that will prepare you students for your future. Um, and students who are not uh, accepted to their uh, first choice school program, I think it's clear that there are programs that need expansion and we need to uh, consider expanding these programs. I also want to take this opportunity to clarify the comment I made last week regarding um, at the board meeting, not last week, at the board meeting, when I stated that um, families who visited Site Night at Long Beach Poly were discouraged from applying to specialized magnet programs. And so I want to be clear, I stand right behind my comment. I personally heard the School of Choice representatives inform parents that if their child did not live within the school boundaries, they would probably not be accepted to the specialized magnet programs at Long Beach Poly. I also happened to have uh, gone to the uh, booth to inquire about CIC, and the rep there thought that I was a parent looking for um, information or seeking information. And I was told that if my child 
was looking to apply to a specialized program there at, at the school that my child would probably not get in if um, Polly was not the school of my residence. Um, I was told to consider applying to other schools and to other programs. And when I questioned uh, why parents were being discouraged from applying to these specialized magnet programs, I was told that I needed to speak to the choice office because representatives, uh, I'm sorry, from, because the choice office had told these representatives um, that this is uh, what they are to tell the parents. So I just wanted to, um, to be clear that this information um, was given to me and um, that I didn't hear this from anyone else. So again, um, just clarifying my comment at the last board meeting, and thank you. I think um, going forward, if you have a concern like that, it might be more appropriate to bring it to staff and maybe not um, part of a board report. I, and this was part of my board comment because I was um, encouraging um, families um, and students to apply uh, to the school of their choice if they had been discouraged from not uh, doing that. So thank you, but I appreciate your feedback. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, I had the pleasure of participating in the 10th annual Women in STEM event at Cabrillo. And um, this event aims to empower and inspire students by showcasing paths and achievements of real women in the STEM field. So the female scholars from Cabrillo's engineering and design pathway, in addition to those uh, excelling in pre-calculus and calculus, are invited to attend. And this event started as, um, well, yeah, this started as a lunch event and it's grown into an all-day affair. Uh, in uh, 2015, six Cabrillo girls went into college with the intention of getting a STEM degree. Six. By last year, that number rose to 107. So they are making real progress. And I'm going to credit this Women in STEM event with some of that uh, progress. So the, um, the day um, started with uh, breakout sessions, well actually a breakfast, um, a breakfast event, breakout sessions. One of the presenters was a former Cabrillo alum, um, Angelica uh, Luquin, and she was wonderful, and she talked to um, the uh, Cabrillo women and said things like, "You are your own best advocate. You're, you know, you're your own best publicist and advertiser." She talked about the importance of networking and her experiences. Uh, I think she's a, a bio, wait, biochemical engineer, something like that. But she's she's working in the industry. And she's quite the success story, and she's imparting her um, well-earned knowledge and experience to her, the, I guess, uh, the current students at Cabrillo. And I, I really want to thank Mr. Ken Fisher for doing this. He's been doing this for 10 years now, but it, it's not, for him, it's not just part of his job, but... It's really um, a, a passion um, for him to give opportunities to these young women. And he works so hard at what he does. And it's not just Mr. Fisher over there at Cabrillo, but I met so many teachers and, and staff people that truly have a passion for their students and it's very inspiring and and they work hard and it's not just for this one event it's it's to support these young women across the board and make sure they have lots of opportunities they secure sponsorships and 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 take these women on on field trips really incredible field trips i wish i could remember what they were exactly but very impressive so um 
hats off to our Cabrillo staff because they are doing fabulous things, just fabulous things. And then as an announcement, I want to mention that the Prisk Native Garden will be hosting an open house on Sunday, April 7th from 1 to 4, and also Sunday, April 14th um, from 1 to 4. And you can find that garden on the corner of San Vicente and Los Arcos. It's really a wonderful treasure, kind of like a hidden little treasure in our district. Um, and we have a volunteer who's been in that garden. He's been volunteering his time in that garden since my oldest son was in third grade, and now that boy is 36 years old. Mm -hmm. So this volunteer, Mr. Mike um, Letterell, Mr. Mike, <laughs> is um, so dedicated, and he he brings the the students in. He's now opening the garden to the community, whoever wants to visit. So I highly recommend a visit to the Pris Garden. Uh, Dr. Baker. Thank you. I'll just end the evening highlighting a couple of fabulous things also going on across the district that have not been shared yet. Um, the first is this week we celebrate Walk to School Week. And so if you have noticed the presence of more walkers in neighborhoods, that is because this is a celebration of Walk to School. Um, specifically, I want to highlight the collaboration between our school, school safety teams and school teams and just share a story from Lafayette that was um, about some of the interactions this week. So throughout the event, our team had over 200 interactions with students, staff, and parents. These interactions range from providing guidance on safe pedestrian practices to simply offering a friendly presence along the designated routes. Each interaction served to foster a stronger sense of trust and community within Lafayette Elementary. And that's, that is an illustration from one of our school safety team members who was there participating in Walk to School. So lots of good collaboration and many reminders about um, what it means to be safe in the community. So. Also want to just highlight our migrant education students. They participated in the, tw um, in the uh, 23 of them participated um, from middle and high schools in different sessions for a full day of public speaking interchange. For the fourth consecutive year, here's the celebration, LBUSD migrant education program students again emerged as the district with the most significant awards in this regional tournament. A total of 28 individual trophies were clinched in either first, second, or third place, as well as the first place debate high school team. The consistent success of our students year after year serves as a testament to the effectiveness of our academic preparedness and the dedication and hard work of our staff, students, and families. As a result, 14 of our LBUSD and Migrant Education Program student winners will represent Los Angeles County speech and debate team in the 2024 State Migrant Education Program speech and debate tournament to be held in Monterey, California, May 3rd through 5th. Um, so just want, really want to shout out our students who are developing their language and just going for it in terms of speech and debate. And to thank Martha Ensminger, who continues to support our migrant education families and students to ensure that they are successful. So beautiful news that will be publicized more beyond this moment, but just really want to recognize them. I want to thank families who have come out for open house. As you shared, Dr. Benitez, it's hard to be in the room when we know that our community is out in schools and encourage tomorrow evening high school families to take a look at what their students are doing. I've loved seeing students tell the stories of their classrooms and tour their families around. Um, today is Activities Directors Day across our district, and I want to express my gratitude. Our Activities Directors in our high schools just do a phenomenal job contributing to the culture, the school spirit, and what makes high school special for many of our students. So thank you to our Activities Directors. And then lastly, one um, notice there will be a classified job fair at our Long Beach School for Adults on April 5th, 2024, and there's, there is information available on the district website, but we have many vacancies for classified jobs. Want to call our community in, whether it's a first time job seeker, in some cases coming right out of high school looking for a job and uh, um, other advanced jobs in the district, but many available jobs that we hope our community will put the word out and come in and apply for a job at Long Beach School for Adults on April 5th, 2024. And that concludes my report. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and that concludes the business 
um, <clears throat> of this meeting. So without objection, we will adjourn and send our best wishes to our colleague, Mr. Miller, and I believe he's, he's waiting on his second child to be born. So um, we're, just, we're just waiting on that good news. Uh, so thank you everyone for being with us that uh, this meeting is adjourned.